Or how many, what do you think? Yeah, I think I think we can get started. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. So welcome uh, everybody. Everybody. So today, uh, I'm, it's my, I'm pleased to uh, introduce Azad Khariqi, who will be talking about uh, approximations of the restless bandit problem. So this is part of a special uh, afternoon on intersections between uh, ergodic theory and machine learning. And the next speaker is uh, Michele Caprio, and then the the, the last uh, last one would be uh, Shayan from uh, Mukherjee from. Uh, Duke University. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Azad. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, the title of this talk is on restless bandits, but I'm going to start with a bit of uh, kind of putting this result in a bigger context of how uh, dynamical systems and ergodic theory can be used for solving machine learning problems. So this means I'm going to start with some motivation. I will talk a little bit about dynamical systems. How can they be used for modeling long range dependencies? And why is that even important? Why do we even need to care about dependencies? Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, this result that we have on restless bandits. So I'm going to start. I, I don't know how familiar the um, audience is with bandits. So I'm just going to explain the problem and hopefully um, highlight the possibilities and limitations of this problem uh, in the context of long range dependencies. And then I will end with some uh, concluding remarks. Okay. Um, so, okay. So let me, let me start with some motivation. Um, basically in machine learning, uh, all of the data sets that we deal with, they are somehow complex and um, they have unknown complex structures. And we, most of the time, they are sequential. We observe them over time. For example, um, financial market data, um, it has some dependent structure over time. And we observe sequences of um, financial market data. So it's, it's a kind of data that is, you know, you, you can't just assume some sort of independence or IIDness there. Um, similar with, um, uh, structures like biological data or audio and video data. Um, social networks is a good, good example. You have, um, first of all, it evolves over time, but every at every time point you have um, a very complex network with lots of dependencies as well, right? So um, all of this to say that for uh, most of machine learning problems that we deal with now, we need to somehow um, have a means to um, model the unknown underlying uh, stochastic processes that give rise to this data. So we, we want to make as little assumptions as possible about that, all the while having uh, uh, guarantees, theoretical guarantees, in the presence of potentially highly dependent data points, okay? So um, how do we do this? One of the approaches is to um, use dynamical systems. Um, so what's a discrete dynamical system? It's basically a probability space together with a measurable transformation. Now we can basically use dynamical systems to view stochastic processes so basically a stochastic process could be a discrete time stochastic process could be viewed as um, a special case of a dynamical system. So here um, your measurable space will be, suppose you have an alphabet, which is a subset of the reals. For example, it could be the bounded zero one interval. So these are the values of your stochastic process. Then you can think of um, a stochastic process as uh, first starting with um, the sample space, which is the set of all infinite sequences. You can equip that with this um, Borel sigma algebra, which is cylindrical, so it's generated by the cylinder sets. And then a very simple measurable transformation, which is basically the left shift. So it takes an infinite sequence x1, x2, and so on, and shifts it to the left, so you end up observing from uh, index two onwards, right? 
And now, so once, once you have this measurable space together with a probability measure on this, then you can obtain a sequence of random variables as uh, basically just by coordinate projections, okay? So um, why is this useful? Um, because then you can, you can think of a stationary ergodic process basically as, a, as an example of a um, dynamical system that has um, that is in so the its measure is invariant under the shift transformation that's stationary, and it's ergodic if um, any invariant set has a trivial measure. So it's either measure zero or measure one. Um, now an ergodic process can also be so by by the virtue of the ergodic theorem, you can say that this is equivalent to saying that. Um, basically the frequency of occurrence of the cylinder sets in a given um, sequence of observations, this empir it's empirical measure basically uh, converges in the limit as n goes to infinity, the length of, the length of observation so far going to infinity go, uh, goes to uh, the underlying measure of the process. So all this to say that the law of large numbers hold, right? So um, this is a good, this is a good framework, I argue, that because um, it allows for long range dependencies, right? So here, um, even though I already have um, uh, a law of large numbers type uh, result, I don't need to assume, for example, independence, IID assumption or something. Now, um, what is, let's, let's look at some of the possibilities and limitations of this framework. So essentially, because we have law of large numbers, um, we can have some asymptotic consistency for problems such as, for example, um, time series clustering and classification, change point estimation, uh, sequence prediction, and so on. So time series clustering is an example where when you're, you want to put together data point in, in a clustering problem, you want to put together data points that are more similar to each other. Um, so here, each data point in itself is a long sequence of observations. So you can think of this as um, a sample generated by some unknown stationary ergodic process. And then clustering here can actually have a meaningful notion because you can define your ground truth to be, I'm going to put together samples if and only if they have been generated by the same um, process. I am sort of giving an example here, but this clustering problem doesn't really have much uh, relation to the rest of the talk. It's just, I just wanted to give you an example. Now, um, similar with change point detection. So you have, suppo suppose you have a piecewise stationary uh, sample. Um, the first half of it, or maybe a segment of it is generated by some stationary ergodic process. Then a, a, another segment of it is generated by another stationary and ergodic process and so on. And only using law of large numbers, you can already devise algorithms that consistently estimate retrospectively the uh, locations at which the process distributions have changed. Now, this is good, but um, you can't go beyond this. So if I only assume that my processes are stationary and ergodic, without further assumptions on their memory. Um, for example, if I don't assume that they are mixing or uh, super extreme case, but if I don't assume that they are IID, then I will not have finite time analysis because in this larger class of processes, we don't have rates of convergence of empirical pr pr uh, frequencies to their underlying probabilities. So all I can, all I can aim for in this larger class of processes is um, to have a, a more passive approach. I'm given a data set and then I retrospectively analyze this data set. Either I cluster the data points, each, each of which is a time series, a sample generated by some a stationary ergodic process, or I detect the changes retrospectively and so on and so forth, or sequence prediction. Um, what I can't do though, is I won't be able to say, 
look, I've had n samples and here's my algorithm, here's my clustering algorithm, here's how it's performing um, in terms of um, uh, clustering my data points after observing n samples from uh, my time series, right? So I, I don't have that kind of finite time analysis. Now, this might not be a problem, so it might be that maybe you're okay with this. Maybe, maybe you prefer to have asymptotic guarantees um, and not necessarily care for finite time analysis, um, but then you would rather consider a larger class. But if you do want to have finite time analysis, then you will need to make further stronger assumptions. In some problems, which one of one of one example of which will be in this uh, talk, you actually need the finite time analysis because not every machine learning problem involves a passive approach. You are, sometimes you need to interact with the environment and collect samples. So in the rest of this talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe uh, the bandit problem, the multi arm bandit problem. And then I'm going to talk about how um, in the presence of dependent structures, you can actually define the problem and what kind of uh, possibilities and limitations you have there. By the way, I'm not able to monitor the chat. So if you have any questions, just give me a shout, okay? Um, good, so, okay, so what's a restless bandit? What's a bandit problem actually? <laughs> Um, a Bennett problem is a sequential decision-making problem under uncertainty, right? So the kinds of problems that you want to deal with are um, what um, stock market, um, what stock should be included in a portfolio, right? In order to maximize the expected profit, not necessarily immediately, but over time, right? Or um, suppose you are designing um, a bot to, to play a strategic game like chess or go. Um, what is the next move that it should take in order to not necessarily ha have an immediate advantage over the opponent, but it overall in the end wins the game, right? Um, recommendation systems. Um, what product should you be recommending to a user? Um, in order to make sure that, in order to maximize the probability that that user is going to be interested in this product, right? And um, probably uh, the uh, initial motivation for this, uh, which was medical trials, and probably the most relevant to our times now. So um, what medication should you uh, give to a given subject who is participating in a med medical trial in order to maximize the number of subjects who receive the more effective drug, right? So all of these problems, they have one thing in common. They have an exploration exploitation dilemma. You, you, you're interacting with an environment, you're collecting some information, and um, you, given the information that you've collected so far, you want to make the, dis the best decision given that information. Um, my analogy for this exploration and exploitation is um, coffee tasting, right? So I love coffee um, and I, I like to try different flavors of coffee, but in a given um, coffee tasting, uh, uh, session, I can only afford to have so many, right? So I, I want to uh, try as many uh, coffee, different coffee flavors as possible, um, but I want to get to my favorite flavor as soon as possible. So I don't want to um, get my heart rate through the roof before I find the flavor that I want, right? So this is, this is sort of the exploration exploitation uh, trade-off that all of these problems have in common. Okay, so how do we um, go a little bit more mathematically around formulating this problem? So essentially, in um, a simple setting, we have k arms or k different choices, okay? 
Um, each arm corresponds to a distribution. You can think of each arm as a different flavor of coffee. Okay. And um, at every time step, so you're, you're playing this repeated game, right? So at every time step, you choose, a, uh, you choose an arm. And as a result of that, you receive a numerical re reward, okay? Um, this reward is basically a sample generated by that arm or by that distribution. And your objective is to maximize the expected cul cumulative reward over time, right? So um, let's think a little bit about how we would solve this problem, which is a rather simple problem in the sense that we only have IID samples. So each sample that I receive when I, when I sample an, an arm, the, the sample that I received is independent of the previous one. Um, okay. So um, I apologize if you're already familiar with this. Uh, I just wanna make sure that everybody is on the same page. Um, so a simple solution to yeah, sorry, there, there's a question, uh, but oh. if you're not, I mean, yeah, you can interrupt him if you want. You can. Yeah, yeah, please, please interrupt. Yeah, he's asking about uh, can IID be relaxed? Yes, that's the that is actually going to be the talk. So we're gonna relax the IID assumption. Does that answer your question? Hopefully, it does. Okay. Absolutely. So, yeah. Thanks. Looking forward. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So, um, in the IID setting, um, here's how you can approach the problem. You can uh, so you can use the the um, observations that you've seen so far to calculate an upper confidence bound on the empirical estimate of the mean of each arm. I have a picture down here that is sort of depicting the situation. Suppose I have two arms. Uh, mu one corresponds to the mean of the first arm, mu two uh, to the second arm, and obviously mu one is greater than mu two. I don't know these values. If I did, I would only stick to, to arm one. I would always sample arm one. I don't know that. So I, I need to explore and exploit. So I, as part of my exploration, I will collect samples and as I collect samples, I calculate an empirical estimate of uh, the mean mu1 and mu2. So in this example, I have two samples from arm2. So these two will help me uh, generate uh, an empirical estimate of mu2. And as part of that, I will also end up with an upper confidence bound around the mean, which is this green line right here, right? And, um, and the strategy is quite simple. It's select the arm with the highest upper confidence bound. Um, the intuition is rather simple. The intuition is when I select an arm, um, either of when, when I select an arm with a higher QCB, one of two things happen. Either I've, I've selected this correctly. So for instance, at time T, I've selected uh, an arm, I, I've selected uh, arm one because it had the higher uh, upper confidence bound. That's not depicted in this picture, but imagine that's the case. So I'm fine, I've, I've just selected the better arm. Or I select the suboptimal arm only because my UCB is deceiving. It's not correctly. It's it's not correctly reflecting the reality of the situation, which is what's going on here. So in here, I don't have enough samples from arm two, so my upper confidence bound is misleading, right? But but then I end up selecting it as as a result of this selection. I will use that sample and adjust my uh, empirical estimate and its corresponding UCB. So I'm not proving this, but as it's, it's rather simple to see that asymptotically, after n rounds of play, using a concentration bound such as Hofting inequality, you can show that um, you, you, the expected number of times that you end up selecting the suboptimal arm is going to be logarithmic in n, n being the number of rounds that you've played so far. Okay, now, okay, so, 
back to the question that that was raised earlier, uh, are rewards always IID? Um, let me give you an example for recommendation systems. So suppose that I, um, I'm on IMDB and suppose that I end up uh, being recommended to watch this movie on the left and I watch it and I like it. And then I end up getting these six recommendations, right? And so I've watched this guy yesterday. Now I'm watching, I, I'm selecting either of these six to watch today. Clearly these two events are dependent on each other, right? So no, in many cases, the rewards are not necessarily IID. In this simple recommendation system scenario, um, the event that I'm selecting any of these six um, movies to watch today is quite dependent on the fact that I watched this movie on the left yesterday. Okay. But so what? So what happens? What happens if the rewards are dependent? What happens is that the strategy that was that I described earlier is not going to work because um, the confidence intervals are going to be based on IID assumption. Um, which are not necessarily going to hold in this more uh, general setting. Um, so this means that if we sample, if we follow that strategy that I described earlier, uh, we're not we're not necessarily going to have any performance guarantees. Okay. Now, what did we do? So what we thought was let us generalize the processes that generate the underlying rewards to a mixing process. What's a mixing process? A, a process is mixing if it asymptotically forgets about its past. So if I have an event, so if this is a sample path of my process, an event corresponding to the first uh, one to you elements um, could be independent, almost independent of an event happening in this part of the process or in this uh, sigma algebra, provided that M is long enough. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to define mixing processes in a second, but I just want to kind of uh, convey the intuition and also uh, motivate why this makes sense, in, at least in this setting. So in this setting, it makes sense because going back to the recommendation system example, we, we're, as individuals, we're also forgetful. So if, for example, I watched this movie really back in 2005, right? And I happened to see any of these um, recommendations anyway back then, it's quite likely that, you know, now in 2021, if I happen to select any of these six movies to watch, it is quite likely that it's independent of the fact that they were in, indeed recommended to me back in 2005. I hope that's that's clear. So what I'm trying to say is if today I end up watching Rosetta, then it could well be that it's quite independent of the fact that back in 2005, a recommendation system uh, recommended it to me. Okay. So this is, this is the motivation for the generalization that we're going to make. And then in a second, I'm going to describe the, the problem. Yeah, so now, there's a question. Yeah, so there's yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. Please. Amel, did you want to ask directly? Yeah, sure. Sorry, I didn't know if you mentioned this earlier, but in this, are you assuming a stationary environment uh, so that the rewards don't change with time or state or anything like that? Yeah, so I'm actually going to describe this in a second. So yes, I'm going to assume that the rewards are going to be um, stationary, but I will also talk a little bit about the complications that you obtain uh, when interacting with these stationary processes. So let me actually get into this. So uh, first, let me define a uh, phi mixing process. Um, a phi mixing coefficient, phi sub m, is the maximal difference between the marginal probability of an event happening in um, um, a part of the, of the process uh, minus the conditional probability of that event happening m steps earlier in uh, the first, say, u 
it, the filtration F sub Q, right? So this is the maximal difference between the probable, the marginal probability minus the conditional probability of an event uh, conditioned on something happening in the past. Um, now, a process is phi mixing if in the limit, as this gap between these two filtrations go to infinity, this phi sub m goes to zero. Okay, this is the process that we're going to use to model the bandit problem. So, what is the new bandit problem that we're talking about today? It's the same as before, so we still have k arms. Um, and these guys are going to be, instead of being IID, they're going to be uh, stationary phi mixing. I will explain what I mean by jointly stationary phi mixing in a second. And um, now the rest of the game is exactly as before. So at each time step, we choose an arm and we receive a numerical reward. Um, and our objective is to maximize the expected cumulative reward. Now here, I'm assuming that the value of the rewards that we get is between zero and one. It could be any bounded interval in R, okay? Um, so, okay, so let me, let me take one step further and actually describe this uh, a little bit more technically. So I'm saying that the processes are jointly phi mixing. What I mean is that Imagine now um, a sample space. So going back to, I'm going to define the infinite sequence spaces and then use the coordinate projections as my uh, stochastic sequence of observations. Basically, sorry, sequence of random variables. Now here, it's the same thing, except we have uh, the product space. So 0, 1 to the n times k. So imagine an infinite matrix, k by n, right? And uh, being the natural numbers, still cylindrical sigma algebra, and then each x i j is just the coordinate projection. Okay, and now what I mean by jointly phi mixing, so I have a I have a joint measure on this uh, uh, bigger uh, probability space that I defined, and I'm saying that these guys are jointly phi mixing in the sense that the phi mixing coefficient calculated now with respect to the events happening in this bigger sigma algebra, the first, K, uh, the first U elements, but all K rows, and then those N steps later, that phi N is going to go to zero as N goes to infinity, okay? So this is what I mean by jointly phi mixing. Um, is this clear so far? Yeah, there are no questions so far. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna continue, but if, if there is a question, just ping me, okay? So okay, so now um I want to define a what happens in this in this scenario. So I, I want to define a policy, right? So at every time step. The player selects an arm according to some mapping, which is a random variable uh, which maps to one of the k arms. And once it does this, then it receives a reward x sub t pi t. Now we require that these pi t's, these mappings, to be measurable with respect to the filtration that tracks the rewards obtained so far. So not the entire thing, but whatever's been observed so far. With the, with the first one being the trivial sigma algebra. So this measurability assumption um, implies that basically pi t can be written as a function of the past rewards. Now a policy is just a sequence of such mappings. So it's a sequence of mappings pi sub t, each of which is measurable with respect to the observations so far. Okay. Now let us define what's the best we can possibly do here. I'm going to call this new star sub n. So after n rounds of play, the best we can do, I'm going to call this, so this is the maximal expected cumulative rewards after n rounds. 
which is the supremum over all possible policies. So capital pi corresponds to all such policies, sequences of mappings, each of which is measurable with respect to the uh, filtration that keeps track of the observation so far. Now, the, the supremum over that of the expected cumulative reward up to, to round n. Okay. Um, let's look at an example. So this, this, this all looks a little bit too abstract. Let's look at an example. Suppose that um, we have two arms and both of them have um, a, a binary Markov chain uh, process. So they're not even necessarily a general by mixing process. They're just binary Markov chains with this transition matrix. They're both the same. They're, they, both, they both have the same um, transition matrix. And by the way, before I move on to this example, let me just emphasize that as you sample, um, the processes still move on. So that, that is actually why the problem is called a restless banded problem. Okay, so um, now these are two typical sample paths of this, uh, this process. The you know, arm one and arm two um, both have the same dynamic and these are two uh, sample paths. Right now, I'm playing this with this environment, right? So I don't necessarily see everything. I only see what I what what I sample from. The, I I only see the um the realization of the arm I sampled from. So let me give you an example. Suppose that I start with arm two, and I happen to uh, sample arm two for a while, and then I switch to arm one, and so on and so forth. The, the reason why I want to give you this example is that I kind of want to convey the intuition that even though these two arms have exactly the same dynamics and therefore the same stationary mean, I could potentially do better by switching between these arms. So if I have an optimal switching strategy, then um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in business because I'm going to be doing better than identifying the arm with the best stationary mean, okay? So let me give you an example here. Suppose, this is, this is quite a nice example actually here. This is a nice setting here because not, it doesn't always happen that you end up with a burst of ones, but suppose this is the case. Now, the, the idea is that basically I would switch, knowing this, suppose I know the dynamics, then knowing the dynamics, I would only switch when I see a zero, right? Why do I do this? Because once I see a zero, it's likely that I will end up with a burst of it, right? Now, when I switch, then I have a non negligible probability that I might end up on a one, which could be part of uh, a burst of ones. Or I'm unlucky and I end up with a burst of zeros, but I haven't changed anything. But on average, by switching, I will have changed my chances of, you know, I, I will have increased my chances of getting more than the, the stationary mean. Okay. This is not going to be the case in uh, the IID setting because in the IID setting, you, can, you don't have dependencies to leverage. Here, we have dependencies to leverage. Now, I'm assuming in this example that we know the dynamics only for the sake of argument, not because in the problem we're considering, we do know that. We don't. We don't know the dynamics. And in the problem that we're considering, we don't have Markov chains. This is just an example. Now, what is the limitation? As always, there is some limitation. So here, uh, the limitation is that finding the optimal switching strategy is P-space hard, right? So um, actually, this, is, uh, this negative result is a little bit on the, is in a more general setting where the, there is non-stationarities in the dynamics, but um, I believe that this uh, hardness result could also carry over to the stationary case. Now, okay, so if this is if this hardness result exists, then the question that we had was, what can we do, right? So the first question we had was, suppose that we don't leverage the, the dependencies in that sense, so we don't go for the best switching strategy, how much do we lose? 
And this, this result is quite interesting to me because um, basically we, we show that, I'm sorry about the wordy slide, by the way. I'm just gonna speak through it. So basically we show that the best, which would have been uh, the best th that we could have obtained by uh, using the best switching strategy, uh, minus the, if we always ended up with the best stationary mean at every round is upper bounded by something that reflects the dependent structure in the process. Okay, so this is upper bounded by 2n phi 1. Remember, phi 1 is the phi mixing coefficient between two consecutive uh, elements of the, of the process. Okay, so I, I see there are some questions, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's a question about Itamar. Yeah, um, yeah, Itamar, you can just unmute yourself. Yeah, again, everyone, feel free to, to, to interrupt the speaker whenever you, you see a chance. Okay. Well, you, you mentioned before at the start you had a left, a left, uh, something about left shift. Uh -huh. Now, your example, arm one, arm two, looks like there is a, a, some shift there between them. To me, they are the same up to. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, sorry about the confusion. Right? No. Um, good. Those blocks yeah. are shifted with. <laughs> okay. Um, this example is just to give you two samples, two sample paths, two typical sample paths of the same process, right? Um, which, yes, I can see that if you considered the space of infinite sequences, then t to the maybe however many zeros are here is going to be equal to this, it looks like it, maybe. That's just because of the way I constructed this. It has absolutely nothing to do with, it's not like I can go t to the n arm one, then I'm going to end up with um, arm two. This is okay, just, fine. This is just an fine. example. I, I, I didn't want to create that kind of confusion. Okay, I got left it. Shift is basically the same as uh, projecting so for example and you know say three zeros then you know I, I shift it to the left and then project this is this is going to be my element as opposed to um just coordinate projection of x3 okay any any connection to the cylindrical sigma algebra like what's the role of cylinder what's here? the role Okay, so the cylindrical sigma algebra, so the, the, the set of cylinders are form, form an algebra themselves, right? And the good thing about that is basically when I have, when I generate these, when I generate my sigma algebra using these cylinder sets, a lot of the statistics that I can do could be based on the cylinder sets and then using some sort of phi lambda argument. I could extend it to the entire sigma algebra. So going back to, for example, the clustering example, um, I could have two processes, um, two samples from, say, say I have multiple samples from one of two processes, and I want to put them together based on whether or not they have been generated by the same process. Then I can calculate a distance between these uh, two processes only basing it on the cylinder sets. And then I can show that this distance extends to the, the, the distance between the two process measures. That's the, that's the beauty of, the, of using uh, cylinder sets as opposed to the entire, all of the measurable sets. Okay, thanks. Okay, so, okay. Um, okay, so here we already, we can already quantify how much we lose by um, not going with the best switching strategy, right? So we can quantify um, the, the difference between only going for the best stationary mean um, from uh, between that and going the best for the best switching strategy 
we can say this is upper bounded by something that reflects the dependent structure of the process. But then there could be some motivation. So why would you even want to, how would you approximate this guy? So we already know there are some hardness results. Um, so how would you approximate this? Maybe we can go for the best, switch, best uh, stationary mean, all the while being aware of the fact that um, it's losing with respect to the best switching strategy by this much, provided that phi one is small, which means that if the um, stationary, if, if the dependence is rather low, dependence as reflected by the phi mixing coefficient, then um, you know we're we're still okay. So this is the motivation for going for uh, the best stationary mean. But then I want to highlight a few challenges. Notice going for the best stationary mean is the same as selecting the best arm, as in, for example, what we did in the IID setting, right? Um, but then there's, there are challenges here that would not exist in the IID setting. One example is this. Um, I think this is related to a question that was asked earlier that, you know, do you assume that the reward distributions are stationary? And even though we assume they are, we still lose some of the properties of um, the process as we interact with it. And this is what I want to give an example of. So suppose I only look at one of the arms. And so clearly, because I'm using a policy um, which is basically a random variable which depends on the past observation so far, the times at which I sample this arm is going to be random. These are going to be random variables, right? So the observation, so if this is a typical sample path of arm one, I won't have, a, I won't have observed all of it. I will only observe the ones that I actually sample. So suppose I sampled the arm at time five and then eight and so on, these green ones are the ones that have been observed, right? So this corresponds to x tau one, this guy is x tau two and so on. Now, this, the problem with this is that because of the dependence, it's possible that this sequence of uh, samples that we've observed is not necessarily by mixing anymore. Right, so it might not even be fine mixing. So I had, I, I start with a uh, process that is initially fine mixing, but then I interact with it and I end up collecting uh, a sequence of observations that are not necessarily fine mixing, right? Which means that even if the underlying process has some concentration inequalities that I could use, now with this arbitrary policy, I will not be able to exploit those uh, concentration bounds, right? So let me let me give you an example why this holds. Uh, let's go back to the Markovian case again. So suppose that I have two arms. Arm one is just uh, I'm just using it as a <laughs> placeholder, really. So it's just deterministically set to zero. Okay. Um, but then arm two is generated by this Markov chain with this transition matrix. I can show that this um, process is uh, phi mixing. So basically it converges to the stationary distribution and that um, because, because of that, basically what happens at time zero, say, say some T naught, does not have any impact on, um, you know, on the distribution and time, large enough uh, time steps later, okay? But now suppose I interact with this guy, with this, with this setting. So I'm, I'm constructing a policy uh, which depends on the past only, right? So it's a sequence of, a sequence of mappings, each of which depends on the past. Um, but then this arbitrary policy that I'm, that I'm constructing here is going to generate um, a set of observations, a set of uh, a sequence of random variables, x tau one, x tau two, and so on. And I will show in a second that, I mean, I will argue in a second that these are going to be highly dependent. How is that? So suppose that um, I start with uh, sampling arm two at time one. So the first time, the first round, I will sample arm two. 
Now, I will stick with arm two if the next observation is equal to what I observed at time one, so x sub one and two, or I will, um, if it's not equal, then I will sample arm one, which is basically all zeros anyway, it doesn't matter, but um, I will continue to sample it until, for example, you know, enough time has passed that the uh, distribution has uh, become close to the stationary distribution. Then I will, I will continue doing this. So because of this policy, the, the way this policy is defined, um, I'm generating, I'm ending up with a, a highly dependent sequence of random variables. So even though the second arm, which was a um, phi mixing uh, process, it was a Markov chain, um, uh, you know, even though that the underlying process was phi mixing, what I end up with is uh, not gonna is, is gonna be highly dependent of the, on the first element, so it's definitely not gonna be mixing of any in any form. Okay, so all this example to say that um, we can't just go for any arbitrary policy, right? Once we do that, then we end up with a sequence of observations that do not necessarily inherit the properties, the mixing properties of the underlying process itself. This is one of the challenges. So how did we how did we overcome this challenge? We had two observations. The first one was, by the way, are there any questions so far? Okay. So um, the first observation was that suppose I select I, I sample this arm at some random time tau. But then I stick with it for a long batch of length L. Then I can show that this process, x tau, x tau plus one, and so on, is going to be phi mixing. So in the sense that if this batch is long enough, then it'll forget about its past, right? In the in the phi mixing sense. But then this process is going to be different from the original process because we started at a random time. Another thing we show is that the um, average expectation of these guys starting at a given random time, tau, is going to be closer and closer to the underlying stationary mean of the process in the sense that it's going to be upper bounded by uh, something that uh, at the top you have the sum of the mixing coefficients and at the bottom you have the length of the batch. Now suppose this guy is constant. So suppose that the mixing coefficients, the sequence of mixing coefficients is summable, then this is going to be some constant. So in the limit as L goes to infinity, I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to get this average to get closer and closer to the uh, stationary mean. Okay, so I think you already, you can already guess how these observations can help us. So essentially these two together um, um, with um, concentration bounds such as Hofting type inequalities for phi mixing processes will allow us to have a UCB type strategy to identify the best stationary mean in a similar fashion as we did for the IID setting. Okay, so um, I can't tell if there are any questions. Yeah, is this a form of uh, law of large numbers or central limit theorem? It's a form of central limit theorem, but it's a finite type, right? So it's a Hofting type inequality. Okay, because you wanted the long. Uh, sequence yeah okay thanks um right so okay so again apologies for too much technical uh, notation here but really just listen to me <laughs> okay um suppose that the sum of the mixing coefficients is finite so the mixing coefficients are summable and i happen to have 
an upper bound on it or, or its value actually. Then this uh, algorithm that I will describe in a second will work. Now, how does the algorithm work? Um, so start with some initialization. For example, you could start by um, sampling each arm once, right? And then at every round after that, you select the arm which maximizes the following upper confidence bound. This guy is um, a result of uh, the Hofting type inequality for phi mixing. Now, once you sample, right, once you sample that arm, um, then stick with it for a certain number of time steps, which I call S sub J. So S sub J is the number of times this, that arm has been selected so far. So stick with that arm, the minute it has been selected, stick with that arm for two to the power of the number of times it has been selected in the past. So for example, say arm two was selected three times so far, and this is the fourth time that as per this um, uh, UCB, we decide to select it, then stick with that for uh, eight more time steps, okay? And that's it, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, so once, once you do this, so this is, this is slightly different from the algorithm we talked about for the IID setting, because in the IID setting, you can just go back and forth between the different um, arms without worrying about whether or not to, to stick with a single one. Okay, so what can we obtain without going into too much detail? Um, I just want to highlight something about the result that we get here. Um, the regret of the algorithm, which is defined as after n rounds of play, how often did I not select the best stationary mean? Um, so, you know, in ex the expected, the, the difference in what you would have obtained by following your policy, in this case, the policy that I described, um, minus the number of times that you should have selected the best stationary mean, this is the regret, you can show that this is upper bounded by a quantity that has the some of the mixing coefficients in it as, as a parameter. So let's compare this to the IID setting. In the IID setting with the strategy that I described in the beginning of the talk, you would end up with such a bound on the regret. Now here, um, even though um, we have dependence and everything, um, we can still derive a bound that is only um, a factor of four different from the case where the rewards are IID. So in other words, um, the algorithm is robust against the dependencies. And what is also cool, in my opinion, is the fact that the dependence appears, the dependence measure being the sum of the mixing coefficients, appears in the bound and in the algorithm. OK. Um, now, remember, this is the regret with respect to the best stationary mean. Obviously, we, ha we have linear regret with respect to the best switching strategy, because remember, there was a plus n times phi one, right? So here, we're just saying, suppose I really just want to go for the best stationary mean. OK, um, so I just want to end with a bunch of concluding remarks and open directions. Um, I think what I'm most excited about this result is the fact that um, even though obtaining an optimal solution in this uh, scenario is intractable, we were able to create a first approximation for it using a very simple algorithm, right? Now, the algorithm um, has its limitations as all algorithms. So this one in particular, Remember, I require to know a bound on the sum of the mixing coefficients. 
Um, this is, to be fair, um, most of the results on mixing processes actually assume bounds on individual mixing coefficients. So phi one, phi two, and so on, they, they assume a rate function for those. For example, they assume that it's geometrically mixing and so on. We're assuming a, sum, a, a bound on the sum of the mixing coefficients, which is a little bit more relaxed. But to be honest, it's still not great because it doesn't really make sense to, from a practical perspective, it still doesn't make sense to know such a bound, right? So one obvious um, fun direction is to say, well, how am I going to uh, estimate either uh, the sum of the phi mixing coefficients or at least how much I'm losing with respect to the best switching strategy as per, uh, as reflected by phi one through an adaptive approach. Um, then, so remember, we had a first approximation of this um, new star, which was the best you can obtain by going for the best switching strategy, but maybe we can go for a be better approximation than just sticking with a stationary mean using Markovian policies. Um, then remember, I'm assuming a finite number of arms, so a clear extension would be to consider linear bandits or uh, just a more general uh, scenario like contextual bandits and so on. And finally, uh, we're working on a lower bound actually for this uh, 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 bound that we had for this for this bound. So it's interesting to, to know to have a lower bound to see how tight it is. And that's pretty much it. So thank you for listening. And if there are any more questions. All right, thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, all right. That's, uh, thank you very much. I think it's, uh, yeah, we'll just have a little break and then the uh, next speaker is Michelle at 2.30 in, in half an hour. Okay, great. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Virtual applaud. Thanks. Yeah, all right then. So welcome back. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Michelle Caprio. We'll be talking about uh, Ergodic theorems for lower probability kinematics. kinematics. Yeah, Michele, whenever you are ready. Thank you very much. Um, so this is a joint work uh, with uh, Shai and Mukherjee, uh, my my advisor, who's gonna also be next speaker. So, right. So, uh, in this talk, uh, uh, I'm going to we are I'm going to bridge a decision theoretic approach involving sets of priors and sets of probability measures in general, uh, with a rather forgotten way of updating subjective beliefs, that's called Jeffrey's updating. And uh, therefore, I first uh, will try to convince you that uh, uh, adopting such a, a decision theoretic approach is, uh, is a smart thing to do. Uh, then I'll try to motivate the, the, the choice of Jeffrey's rule of conditioning to update prior subjective beliefs, as opposed to, for example, uh, Bayesian updating that is uh, very much more widespread. Uh, and then, of course, I'm going to give the, the, the main results that are Gothic results for the limit that I call P star infinity of uh, successive Jeffries updates of the set of plausible prior probability measures, which is this calligraphic P right here. Uh, I'm also, uh, give a, I'll, I'll also give a strong law of large numbers for Jeffries updating uh, when omega is uncountable, uh, which is a um, uh, corollary to these ergodic results. And um, if, if I have time, I'm also going to give necessary sufficient conditions for the sequence to contract, uh, for the sequence of successive updates to contract. And this basically means that the limit, uh, in the limit, uh, all the elements of the of the limit set uh, agree with each other, so are the same elements basically. Right. Also, if you have any any question, uh, please uh, interrupt me because, as uh, as Professor Kalegi was saying, I cannot see the chat very well. Um. Yeah, so, so before uh, giving motivations, I'm, I want to convince you that uh, our contributions are actually relevant in the fields of uh, data science and, and machine learning. So 
the ergodic theorem for the limit set ensures that the limit of the of uh, time averages uh, of a function f along trajectories of an operator of interest exists almost everywhere uh, and they are related to space averages taken with respect to the lower and upper probability associated with uh, the limit set and i'm going to talk more extensively about these things later and how are these important so we are going to consider operators that explore all the state space that is uh who the, the union of the orbits is going to be the the whole state space omega and and this is interesting because uh since we can see the data we collect as realization of random variables basically um these empirical averages these time averages right here are a function of the data right a function g where g is the composition of the f of interest and the counter image of the random variables uh whose whose uh whose image are the data we collect. Um, and this buys us the fact that time averages and space averages of a function along the trajectories, tj omega, are related to time and space averages of a function of the data we collect. Then a uh, strong law of large number for Jeffrey's updating uh, when omega is uncountable is, is kind of interesting because once we retrieve the triple omega fp star infinity, where this is a generalization of the usual uh, probability space, because this is a set. Uh, the, the strong law of large numbers ensures that the limit of the sample averages uh, of, a, of a sequence of bounded functions is related to the expected values taken with respect to the lower and upper probabilities associated with pistar infinity. And this is interesting because uh, an example of a sequence of bounded function that may be of interest in that analysis are sequence of bounded random variables and this may happen when we have bounded data. Uh, finally, sorry. Uh, finally, uh, necessary and sufficient conditions for P star K to, for the sequence to contract are, are useful because uh, basically we uh, we resolve um, we, we resolve the uncertainty uh, that we have at the beginning of the analysis on which probability to choose to endow the, the measurable space. Right, so why didn't we choose Bayesian updating as, as a way of, of updating our, our subjective beliefs? So despite you being used ubiquitously, and I assume everybody's familiar with, uh, with Bayes formula, uh, Bayesian updating uh, is not without its drawbacks. And in particular, the two drawbacks we focus on on this talk are the following. So it requires a full specification of a prior. And this is this may be challenging. In particular, it's challenging to specify a probability measure on omega f, so on the on the measurable space that represents the initial beliefs, as Berger points out. And also, it requires that the probability of the conditioning event of both the conditioning event and the intersection of the event we are interested in and the conditioning event, uh, they need to be uh, quantified before uh, event e happens. Event e happens. Uh, this may not be the case, for example, when uh, when event e is not anticipated. And therefore, this may be a forced, unrealistic, or impossible task, as Diaconis and Zabel point out. And there are other uh, drawbacks that are more philosophical in nature, but these two are the main ones we address uh, in, in our talk. So, as I told you at the beginning, we combine upper and lower probabilities with Jeffrey's updating, and upper and lower probabilities associated with uh, sets of probabilities alleviate the need to specify a single prior. And uh, Jeffrey's updating alleviates the need to specify probabilities of events that are not anticipated. And also, as you may imagine, despite the greater generality of this setting, we are still able to study the, the properties of the dynamical system induced by our framework. Sorry, by yes. not anticipated, do you mean like zero measure? Yeah, uh, yeah either that or, or events that are, uh, yeah, exactly, for which we give uh, probability zero, but then they happen. And then basic, basic updating can be tricky to work with. Okay. Um, right, so uh, let, let me let me be a little more clear what uh, about what what I mean when I say sets of probabilities. So we we adopt we adopt the decision theoretic approach. In particular, we put ourselves uh, ourselves in the shoes of an agent that faces decision under ambiguity. Um, this means that uh, they face a problem in which information restricts. Uh, reasonable initial beliefs to belong to a set of plausible probability measures and incompleteness of information is captured by the non-singleton nature of this set calligraphic p and this approach uh, let's say hides some measure theoretic complications in that the boundary elements of calligraphic p 
that is in the by, by boundary elements, I mean the infimum and the, and the supremum of the set, are not probability measures, but rather they are lower number probability measures that are a particular type of Shaker capacities. And these latter are basically set functions that are used in applications where standard additive probabilities are inadequate. Uh, and this book by Wall in 1991 is the go-to book when, when it comes to Shaker capacities. Uh, to give you an idea of what they are, basically Shaker capacities are set functions that map from the sigma algebra to zero one, and they are such that the capacity of the empty set is zero, the capacity of the state space is one, and they are monotone. And as you can see from here, we do not require we do not require additivity as we should do for, for regular probability measures. So capacities may be super additive or sub additive, and we're going to talk about more uh, in the next few slides, about this more in the next few slides. Right. So, so what about Jeffrey's updating? Um, I will now describe you how Jeffrey's updating works when the state space is uh, countable. And at the end of the of this explanation, I will also show you how Jeffrey's updating is uh, can be seen as a generalization of Bayes. So uh, the probability kinematics procedure, so probability kinematics is another name for Jeffrey's updating, is given by this equation right here. And you may say, oh, this is the, the usual equation we, we use when we compute a, a probability, but it's not quite right. So this means that the posterior of any event A, of any element A of the sigma algebra, is given by the sum of the conditional prior of A given EJ, where EJ are the elements of, the, uh, of any partition, times the posterior of EJ. And the first thing you may, you may say to yourself is, well, yeah, this makes sense, but uh, I need this condition to be true. Otherwise, this equation does hold. And, and, that's, and that's absolutely right. And this is called Jeffrey's, uh, Jeffrey's uh, rule. And it basically says that uh, this, this equation right here is valid when there exists a partition for which the conditional posterior is equal to the conditional prior. And the first thing that struck me when I, when I started working with this was, oh, but this is a, such a strong assumption. And in reality, it's not, it is not. And I, I'll show you later uh, why. Um, but once, once we accept that uh, we can proceed as such, we have a practical advantage that is uh, we reduce the, the, subject, the subjective assessment of the posterior to the simpler task of assessing the posterior of just the elements of the partition. And uh, there is an even easier form uh, of, of computing, of performing Jeffrey's update that's called likelihood ratio form of Jeffrey's rule, where basically we just need to elicit the posterior of one element of the of the partition to retrieve the posterior of all the other elements and uh, in particular as follows so we pick any element of the partition and we suppose we assess that um, its posterior has to be greater than the prior in the ratio of q that is this is true which is uh, one minus the prior is equal to one over q times one minus the posterior then the posterior of all the other elements is given by is given by one over q times the prior right so once we specify this the posterior of this element ej then the posterior of all the other elements follow accordingly uh, for now i leave uh, one question open that is what if i want a um, mechanical way of assessing this this posterior right here because otherwise it, it's still it may be still uh, not easy no to to specify uh, the posterior of one element just just uh, incorporating our, our subjective beliefs so an algorithm for updating a Jeffrey can be can be seen as follows can be the following one so suppose we have we give we are given any partition ej of omega and as we shall see in a few in a few lines uh, for in Jeffrey's updating uh, the elements ej uh, are uh, so we link partitions to the occurrence of events so basically ej means observations omega observation omega j occurred and i'll be more clear about this in a second and we update p in the space of the probability measures on delta on omega f according to the following algorithm it's actually a procedure it's not an algorithm but uh, you, you will forgive me for this so we collect we collect observations omega one through omega n and you should stop me right here and say what the heck what the heck do you mean like we we, don't, we never collect observations in the form of elements of the state space and you would be right so this means that we first collect n data points x1 through xn that are of course images of random variables 
and then this is a, just a simplified assumption. And then we, we retrieve the elements of the, of the state space as counter image of these random variables. Uh, then we consider the coarsest possible partition consistent with all the observations available. That is, we update EJ to EJ prime such that uh, this EJ prime is built uh, as follows. That, that is, every element of the partition contains one and only one observation. So to this extent, this is what we meant when we say EJ equals observation omega J occurred. So only one omega J belongs to each EJ. Um, perfect. Then uh, we reassess uh, the prior on the new finer partition or not coarser partition. And this is a very delicate step and uh, leaves us with an open question that I'm highlighting in a few, in a few seconds. And finally, of course, we, we update the prior to the, to the, to the posterior using uh, Jeffrey's rule as before. And also, if we want to use the likelihood ratio form of Jeffrey's rule, we, need only, we only need to assess the posterior of one element of the new updated partition. So for now, we have two open questions. The first one is, what if uh, I want a mechanical way of assessing the posterior of, of, this, uh, of this one element uh, instead of, of having to specify it subjectively? And the second one is, this is a very cumbersome uh, step to, to perform. And we would like a, a way of a mechanical way of reassessing p on the on the new final partition. And I, I answer to these two open questions in the following two slides. So the first one uh, again is is what what about a mechanical way of, of computing this posterior right here? And the answer is basically we cheat. So we we compute the we compute base base posterior for uh, for ej star tilde, and then we use uh, the likelihood ratio form of Jeffrey's rule to retrieve the posterior probabilities of all the other elements of the uh, partition of the new final partition. This is uh, morally equivalent to um, empirical based procedure where you make your prior depending on the on somehow depending on the data. And here we are we are using a Bayesian procedure that we we are actually trying to, to overcome by using Jeffries. So, but still, th this really solves us our problem of, of um, having to, speci to subjectively specify the, the probability of one element. And we call this extended Jeffries update because we, we, like, we make this exception to, to our rule. Um, and then, uh, as I was telling you before, uh, we give a mechanical procedure to reassess the probability on a finer partition. And I realized this, this, uh, this procedure can, be, can sound cumbersome when I explain like this, but then I have a, a nice example, so everything should be clear. So suppose we want to assess the prior on a new partition. And of course, suppose that the number of elements of the new partition is greater or equal than the number of, uh, of the previous ones, because we collected more, more observations. Um, say we want to assess the probability of one of the elements of this new final partition and call L the number of unique observations within one of the elements of the previous partition. So what do I mean by this? So suppose we are in this, in this situation right here, right? So suppose E1 is our, um, is our partition at time one, and uh, it is the coarsest possible partition generated by three observations, omega one, omega two, and omega three, which means that omega one belongs to E1, omega two belongs to E2, and omega three belongs to E3. Now we observe two new observations, uh, omega four and omega five, right? And therefore we have a final, a final partition. And of course we assume that omega four and omega five are, are different from the previous ones. So they're new elements. And somehow we know that omega four and omega five end up being within what used to be E3. And uh, what do I mean by this? It means that the distance between these, uh, these new elements and the element that generated E3 is the smallest possible. And the distance I'm considering is distance this, this distance right here, which uh, the, the metric on omega that makes a complete separable metric space in such a way that I fit the Borel sigma algebra. Uh, then what happens is that um, this this mechanical way of proceeding is basically splitting the probability that was that was assigned to E3 equally on the three new elements of the partition. So uh, probability of E1 prime and E2 prime stay the same because uh, 
because we we don't have that the new elements belong to what it, they, what we used to be a one and a two, and uh, the probability that we uh, uh, that we used to assign to e three is now split equally between e three prime, e four prime, and e five prime, and this is uh, this is what this this mechanical procedure is saying. Um, as as I told you, uh, we do not specify borders of the elements of the partition because. Uh, to say that uh, a new observations is with is within uh, a pre an element of the previous partition is given by this by the the, the minimizing distance between the new element and the, the element that gener that generated the element of the uh, previous partition. I hope this is clear. I I, I, I realized that. A question. Yes. Um. So these partitions they depend mm -hmm. on omega, right? So they're random mm -hmm. variables. They're. <clears throat> It depends they, on your samples, right? Uh, it depends on what, sorry? On your samples? Uh, yes, it depends on the observations we collect, yes. Right, so then, like, it's, can I think of this, like, an, as, as an adaptive way of discretizing then, that, like, for example, depending on how your, what your observations are, this discretization is going to be different? Yes, yes, okay. I think you're right, okay. yes. Thanks. Uh, of course. Uh, so I, I hope that the, the procedure is uh, is uh, is clear. If not, please interrupt me, and I'll go through. I'll go over it uh, again. No problem. All right. So now, at the at the beginning, I told you that uh, Jeffrey's update can be seen as a generalization of ordinary Bayes, and how so? So basically, if we consider the partition given by an event and it's complementary. If we have that the posterior of event E is one, then Bayes posterior and Jeffrey's posterior coincide. So if, uh, so basically Jeffrey's is a generalization in that we can condition two events that are not certain. Um, and also Jeffrey's update have, uh, has two important uh, properties to and one of which is an, an advantage with respect to Bayes. The first one is that if we're given a couple of prior and posterior, we can always reconstruct a partition that makes Jeffrey's conditionalization possible. And this is unlike Bayesian conditionalization. This was proven by the Iconisense of M. And also uh, Jeffrey's rule is always viable. That is given any partition E and any prior P, we can always find a posterior P star such that Jeffrey's condition is met. So uh, to this extent, we can see that um, uh, Jeffrey's condition is not that uh, restrictive of an assumption. And again, this was proven by the Econisense of Right, so now that I, I hope I, I explained you uh, in, a, in a clear way how, how Jeffrey's update works, I'll, uh, let me talk about the setup of our work. So um, we, we consider a measurable space omega f, which represents the space uh, where we model uncertainty. Uh, when omega is countable, omega f we assume to be standard measurable. Uh, we call delta omega f the set of probability measures on omega f. And uh, when omega is countable, we endow the space of probability measures with the topology of uniform convergence. That is uh, a sequence convergence if this thing here holds. And if omega is uncountable, we endow it with the relative topology induced by the weak star topology of continuous and bounded functions which is a mouthful and basically means that uh, a sequence of probabilities converges if and only if the integral of f with respect to pn converges to the integral of f with respect to p, where f is a continuous and bounded function on omega. Uh, we assume that the, that the initial prior probability measure set is compact. And this is, this is not a, a too strong of an assumption because basically the agent can specify the, the set however they want and then compute the compactification of that set. For example, the stone check one. So it's not, uh, it's not a big deal. Um, and then we focus on um, two important uh, elements that are an FF measurable transformation that doesn't get stuck. That is the, the, the operator explores all the elements of omega as we said before. And then we have a, a bounded F measurable functional that is the one we are going to use to compute our uh, empirical averages and, uh, and uh, time averages. Uh, the, our observations are going to be of uh, are going to be basically the orbits of the operator uh, of like uh, like that as such. And 
uh, yeah. And in the countable omega case, we consider the sequence of courses possible partition induced by observation by, by these observations, uh, as, as we said before. And uh, we, we also call uh, Pister K the, the sequence of, uh, of uh, updated sets with respect to calligraphic theory. Um, right, so the first ergodic results uh, we give is in the countable case and uh, are the following. So if we call E0 any given initial partition of omega of the form E, e complementary, uh, once and then we, we collect the, the collect our observations and uh, we update E0 to E1, a finite partition, still the coarsest possible partition, but given all the elements available, all the observations available so far. And uh, of course, as we collect more observations, we're going to update E1 to E2 and so on, so on, so on and so forth. Um, so, so yeah, repeating this process, we build the sequence of uh, successive courses possible partitions. And uh, upon observing the first element of this sequence, we update every element in the set of plausible prior probability measures using Jeffrey's rule of condition. And therefore, from calligraphic P, we get calligraphic P star. And uh, the first thing we, we discover is that uh, Jeffrey's update um, preserve compactness. Uh, we then call P star K the sequence of successive updates of our initial plausible set. And this sequence here and this sequence here are intimately related by the Jeffries equation. Uh, a corollary to this proposition is that uh, P star K is compact for every K. And this is useful for some proofs. Um, yeah, so also as the number of observation grows to infinity, as you may imagine, the sequence uh, of, of finer and finer partitions converges to what I call an atomic partition that is the finest possible partition, basically. That is a partition where every element is a singleton. And uh, we denote instead by P star infinity, the limit of the sequence of, uh, of, update, of uh, update of the sets in the Hausdorff metric. Now, we are almost, we are almost at, the, at the main results. I need to, to give you some, some uh, um, elements of, uh, of uh, lower probabilities, uh, of lower probability theory. So uh, a lower probability is defined as such it actually it should be the infimum, but uh, since uh, since we we argued that uh, p star k is always compact, we can replace it with a minimum. Um, and this is a lower probability measure, and it's in particular so it's a shock capacity, and it's uh, super additive, which means that the lower probability of the union of this joint set is greater or equal than the sum of the lower probabilities, and uh, it's. Um, uh, The, the, the counterpart is the upper probability measure that is defined as such. So one minus the lower probability of the complementary. And this is basically equal to the max, right? So we have the, the lower probability, which is the minimum and the upper probability, which is the maximum. And as you may imagine, the upper and lower posteriors provide a type of confidence interval around the true posterior. And this gives us a flavor of robust statistics a la Uber and Ronchetti, another uh, key, work, key book for, for robust statistics. Um, to be consistent with uh, with this notation, we call p star infinity lower bar the lower probability associated with the limit set. And uh, and I promise this is the last uh, the last um, preparatory slide. So the core of a generic shock capacity is the collection of all probabilities that setwise dominate such capacity. And this basically means that it's the collection of all the probabilities p such that p of a is greater or equal than mu of a for every a. Uh, then a generic shock capacity, and then basically uh, a sh uh, capacity is, tau inv is t invariant uh, is the same definition as a probability when, when a probability is t invariant. And uh, we then denote by calligraphic G the set of invariant events that is basically the same definition as, uh, as, as usual. And the generic shock capacity is ergodic if the capacity of the invariant events is either zero or one. So again, very similar to, to the usual actually the same as usual probability measures. So the first result I present you is a lemma that is uh, that, that we use to prove uh, to prove the ergodic theory. And we say that for, in, for every k, if the lower probability associated with the, the set the probability set at time k is invariant and pu is in the core of pk where pu is a probability measure 
such that for all finite subcollection of the of the uh, partition we are considering at time k, uh, having uh, l many elements, we have that pu assigns probability one over l to every element of this subcollection. So if this pu is in the core of the lower probability p star k, then we have that the empirical averages are uh, belong to an interval um, given by um, space uh, yeah, space averages taken with respect to the lower and upper probabilities associated with p star k. Um, yeah, and we're all we're always uh, so this probability here always exists. Uh, and so finally, we are to our ergodic results, and we say that uh, if our sequence converges in the Hausdorff metric to p star infinity, and p star infinity is not empty, and we can also assume that uh, the lower probability associated with p star infinity is invariant, then for every bounded measurable functional f, there exists a bounded measurable functional uh, tilde f on the invariant events, such that the, the limit of the empirical averages is finite, almost surely. And uh, almost surely is basically the same as uh, with, uh, with regular probability measures. So it basically means that uh, p star infinity lower bar of this, uh, of this event right here is one. Uh, and not, not only is finite, but it's actually equal to this calligraphic, uh, sorry, f tilde computed in omega. Same omega as here. Um, Right, and uh, then we use the lemma to retrieve the first equation of the of the following two. So if pu, which is a little different uh, with respect to pu that we that we presented before, but still similar morally, we have that uh, the limit of the empirical averages belongs to the interval given by uh, space averages taken with respect to lower and upper probabilities uh, associated with the li limit set, almost surely. And if instead this condition right here is either too difficult to check or not true, uh, then we have to assume that uh, the lower probability is ergodic. And then we have basically the same thing, but instead of having f, uh, the same f we use to compute the time averages as the, the extrema of this uh, interval, we have, um, uh, we have uh, f tilde, the same f tilde we used to compute, to, to, to ensure that the, that the empirical averages are uh, are actually finite, almost surely. Um, so basically, if you if you stare at it long enough, you may convince yourself that this is a countable version of the ergodic, of the Birkhoff sarcodic theorem with a twi with a twist that is given by this the the, th the 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 fact that we are working with with sets of probabilities. And an obvious corollary is that uh, if lower and upper probability agree, then basically we retrieve the usual uh, Birkhoff sarcodic theorem in the countable uh, environment, in the countable sense. Uh, now uh, let's let's move to the uncountable case, which is way more difficult, uh, uh, but still we can do something about it. So Daikonis and Isabel are the first one that uh, give an uncountable omega version of Jeffrey's updating. So they, they consider a probability space uh, they call p star a new probability measure on the sigma algebra f, and they call f zero a sub sigma algebra of f. Then uh, they call c an f zero measurable set having probability p zero, and also they they ask that uh, the, the the probability p uh, restricted to sub sigma algebra f zero is absolutely continuous with the what is going to be the posterior p star restricted to f0 and this has to hold on omega minus c um, and then the appropriate version of jeffrey's condition is the following so f0 is sufficient for p and p star and this basically means that the conditional the conditional prior of a of any a given sub sigma algebra f0 is equal to the conditional posterior of any a given f0 and when this condition holds uh, Jeffrey's rule of conditioning becomes the following. Uh, the posterior of any set A is given by the integral on omega minus C of the conditional prior of A given F0 dP star plus the posterior of A intersected C. And uh, if, we, if we can assume that um, the, the posterior is absolutely continuous with respect to the prior, uh, we can take uh, C equal to the empty set. So this 
equation right here simplifies. So this one goes to zero, and this integral is taken on the whole omega. Uh, what we do is to we update every element p star k of the set the calligraphic p star k uh, following now, following this equation right here. <clears throat> so again, I misuse here the word algorithm is more of a procedure, but still you will forgive me for that. So we collect our observations in the form of uh, of um, uh, basically images of the operator, and um, we compute the sigma algebra generated by these these observations, orbits of the operator. I, I couldn't uh, remember the, the name. So we compute the sigma algebra given by our, our observations. We call it F1. Then for any set A in F, we compute the conditional probability of A given this sub sigma algebra, that even though it's defined as a set, it's actually a singleton. So it's just one element. And therefore this integral right here is well defined. And then we find the new probability measure that is the posterior such that basically everything that we require here for Jeffries for for equation nine to hold, actually holds. Um, so as we collect new observations, of course, we we compute the sigma algebra generated by all the observations available. So the one we had before plus the new ones, and we so therefore and then we have a, a new sigma algebra, a new sub sigma algebra f two, that is a super a superset of f one, and therefore repeating this pre this process, we build an increasing sequence. Of uh, sigma algebras, sub sigma algebras. Uh, so the sequence, the 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 sequence of uh, of Jeffrey's update of our initial set, and the sequence of uh, of finer sigma of sub sigma algebras, increasing sequence of sigma algebras, are intimately related by this updating procedure that we described before, as are the the limits of both. So the limit of this one is going to be the whole sigma algebra, as you may imagine. And the, the limit of this pistar k is pistar infinity in the Hausdorff metric. Uh, the last, yes, the last thing I need to introduce before uh, before uh, introducing before talking about the ergodic theorem is what uh, what's a Shoke integral. Basically, Shoke integral is a generalization of um, the usual integral we use to compute functions with respect to measures. Instead, we here we are computing functions with respect to integral of functions with respect to uh, capacities. So a generic lower probability measure induces a functional uh, on the set of uh, bounded functionals uh, via a Shoke integral that is given by this sum right here. So, so basically the, the integral of f with respect to a lower probability is given by a sum of two improper Riemannian integrals. And um, if you try it yourself, you see that uh, if instead of having new, here we had a mu, so a, a regular probability measure, uh, then the Shoke integral reduces to, to the standard integral. Again, please, if you have any, any questions, uh, don't hesitate to, to interrupt me. So the ergodic results in the uncountable case are the following. We have a, a more general one, and a sharper one that requires uh, stronger assumptions. So the more general one states that uh, if we if our sequence converges in the Hausdorff distance to pistar infinity, and the lower probability associated with it uh, is invariant, then uh, for every bounded functional, uh, we have a bounded functional in the invariant events such that the 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 limit of the empirical averages is finite almost surely. In addition, if this lower probability here is ergodic, then we have that. Um, the limit of the of uh, space averages, sorry, the limit of time averages right here, uh, belongs to an interval given by uh, space averages taken with respect to lower and upper probabilities, and also taken with respect to this f star right here. Uh, and this this happens almost surely. And uh, yeah, so the, so yes, so um, again, this is. Uh, this is kind of uh, of the the usual Birkhoff sarcodic theorem with uh, two twists this time. So the first twist is uh, using this upper and lower probability kind of approach, and the second one is that we have f star here instead of the same f we use to compute time averages. Uh, of course, uh, what happens when lower and upper probabilities agree? We retrieve uh, we're like the 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 interval shrinks down to a to a single point to a single element. 
And uh, we can give a sharper version of the previous theorem uh, by, by requiring extra assumptions to be met. Um, in particular, for, for this assumption to be met, I, I need to introduce you what I mean by convex continuous and strongly invariant capacities. So a generic uh, capacity is called convex if uh, the capacity of the union plus the capacity of the intersection is greater or equal than the sum of the capacities. It's continuous at omega if the limit of an increasing sequence of sets that uh, grows up to the state space omega, uh, the, the limit of the of the capacity of this of this uh, sequence is equal to the capacity we assign to the state space. And it's strongly invariant, basically, if this happens, where we call a new over bar if the conjugate of new. So if this is a lower probability measure, this is going to be the upper one, and vice versa. Mm, a usual, like a regular probability measure is always continuous at omega. And uh, we also introduce this notation of calligraphic i to denote the set of invariant probability measures on omega. And uh, you know what invariant probability what invariant probability measures are. So a corollary of the previous uh, a corollary to the previous uh, to the previous result is the following. So if omega f is standard measurable, and again if uh, our sequence converges to an empty set, such that the lower probability associated with the limit set is convex, continuous at omega, and strongly invariant, then uh, we have something as before. So the 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 limit of the empirical averages is almost surely finite. And then we have also uh, four, four more uh, interesting results. So the first one says that for every invariant probability measure, this F star right here is a version of the conditional expectation of F given G. And this basically means that F star belongs to the intersection over the P's over the probability measure in the, in the uh, uh, in the set calligraphic I of the expected value taken with respect to P of F given calligraphic G. This is a mouthful, but uh, this is just a, more of a curiosity than something that uh, that is really interesting. Then we have that um, the the Choquet, the Choquet integral taken with respect to F star is equal to the Choquet integral taken with respect to F. And basically this is interesting because now, now we we are in the usual in the in the usual birkhoff sargodic theorem real with the only twist that now we are using uh, upper and lower probability measures and so we have this kind of interval uh, kind of result and of course when when upper and lower probabilities uh, agree we retrieve the usual birkhoff sargodic theorem so we need some extra assumptions uh, for this to hold but of course we are we are operating at a higher uh, level of generality so this this has to be expected any questions so far? If not, <clears throat> uh, let me present um, a strong law of large numbers. Uh, so th th this strong law of large numbers, as I told you at the beginning of the talk, is a um, sort of a corollary to the to the um, uh, to to this to this uh, theorem right here. Um, so. But, but it's but it is still interesting, so let me go through it. So we call uh, bold face f a sequence of bounded and f measurable functionals on omega that these basically are our uh, random variables. Uh, we say that uh, this sequence is stationary if uh, with respect to a generic capacity, if the capacity of the of the collection of elements of of the state space for which the the evaluation of the Fn's on omega belongs to a certain Borel subset B is equal when we take the right shift. Uh, and then we denote by r power n sigma c the measurable space of a sequence endowed with the sigma algebra of the cylinders. Uh, and by s, the shift transformation that uh, uh, Professor Kalegi talked about before. Uh, of course, uh, this this sequence bold face f induces a natural measurable map between omega f and this other measurable space R n with the sigma algebra of the cylinders, given by the evaluations of uh, the yes the evaluations of the of the of these uh, of these um, functions at at omega, right? So omega is mapped to the the evaluation at omega of f one, f two, f k. All the all the elements of the of the sequence, 
<coughs> and given any capacity on omega f, uh, we then define the map uh, new sub sub uh, set sub new uh, f from the sigma algebra of the cylinders to uh, zero one as follows. So we get a cylinder and uh, we map it to the capacity of the counter image of the cylinder according to uh, the, the sequence uh, bold face f. And uh, the last thing we need is that uh, we call a bold face f ergodic if new f is ergodic with respect to the shift transformation s. So it's a, it's just a, a, the, the, the lower probability counterpart of what happens with regular probabilities. So the strong law of large numbers basically tells us that if the, if the sequence converges to p star infinity, and if the lower probability associated with it is convex and continuous up to mega, uh, and further, if this, the sequence bold phase f is stationary and ergodic, then the, the limit of the empirical averages of the of our of our uh, functions f case uh, belongs to the expectation uh, give uh, the expectation of f one so the first element of this sequence taken with respect to the lower and upper probability measure associated with the limit set and this is true almost surely uh, notice that the assumption of stationarity right here uh, yields um, the fact that uh, the limit of the empirical averages exists almost surely and uh, Sorry, and yeah, and then um, we have we basically provide a, a bound uh, for the for the empirical averages, in particular bound given by expected values uh, taken with respect to shaker capacities. Uh, yeah, the, the corollary is the usual one that if the lower and upper probability coincide, uh, then the, the the interval shrinks down to a, to just one element. Now, all right, if there are no questions about uh, anything so far, I have one last, uh, one last thing I want to, to talk about. That is, as you, as you have noticed, I refined a lot, of, uh, a lot of results that I gave in this talk by asking that the lower and upper probability uh, associated with the limit set coincide. But when does this happen? Can, can we give um, a necessary and sufficient condition for it to happen? And the answer is yes, uh, but to, to, to do that, I need to, to introduce uh, Jeffrey's rule for lower probabilities and also an, a, a, um, a theorem of independent interest that will gi give us immediately the, the necessary and sufficient condition. So the generalized version of Jeffrey's rule uh, in, the, um, in the countable omega case is basically is this one. So instead of having the posterior of a given element of the partition, is equal to the prior of a given element of the partition. We have that uh, the same thing, but with elements of the sigma algebra generated by the elements of the partition. And uh, so this, of course, is true for all p star k and all p star k plus one. And its lower probability version is basically the same, but with lower probabilities. So now there are two questions you may ask me. The first one is, uh, how are you sure that this is true? Uh, this is true because because the calligraphic p star k and calligraphic p star k are compact and also because this is true and the second thing that you may ask me is what do you mean by lower conditional lower conditional probability here and here and uh, so there is a huge literature literature on on lower conditional probabilities we assume for simplicity that uh, the the agent endorses what is called the geometric rule that is the lower probability the lower conditional probability of a given b is given by the ratio of the lower probability of the intersection over the lower probability of the conditioning set where we assume this latter to be non-zero non and uh, a theorem uh, that uh, that follows from from these definitions is that if we call b a the smallest set in the sigma algebra generated by the elements of the sigma of the partition uh, such that con such that ba contains a then the lower posterior of a is given by the lower conditional prior of a given ba times the lower posterior of ba and we call this the jeffrey geometric updating group uh, then uh, let me go pretty quickly on the uncountable case basically it's all the same thing with the only difference uh, that um, uh, instead of having a ba we have an intersection of bjs where bj is where bj is a collection 
of, of sets in the sigma algebra fk plus one in, in, given by the, the observations that we collected, such that A is contained in Bj, belongs to Bj. And uh, this, this collection al always exists because since this is a sigma algebra, there is at least one element for which this is true, that is uh, omega itself. Um, and then we're finally here, we're finally to the to the point where I can I can give you uh, unnecessary and sufficient condition for uh, for the sequence to to contract. So for for the lower and upper probability associated with the limit set to coincide. So this is called contraction, and in general, this uh, it's it's a phenomenon in which the lower posterior uh, is greater or equal than the lower prior for every k for every a, and the inequality has to be strict for some k. Okay, um, <clears throat> so by the Jeffrey geometric updating rule, it's immediate to see that a necessary sufficient condition for, for contraction to, to take place is in the countable case for the posterior of uh, BA to be greater or equal than the prior of BA and this, and this uh, inequality to be strict for some K. And in the uncountable case that the posterior of the intersection of the BJs is greater or equal than the lower prior of the intersection of the BJs. And this, in, and this um, uh, inequality is uh, strict for some k. Okay. So if there are no more, if there are no other questions, thank you for your attention. If there are, please ask me, ask away. All right. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Thank you. I have one question. It might be a yes. one. Um, so if I understand correctly, you, instead of going for, um, instead of choosing a prior, you mm -hmm. start with a set of plausible priors, I guess. Yes, yes. And then asymptotically, you show that eventually you, you end up with the right subset of this plausible priors, and eventually you get closer and closer to the correct prior that you would have selected if you'd known more is that so the... all right so first of all uh, thank you for the question so um so the, uh, actually that is uh, th that only happens if if uh, this necessary and sufficient condition for the contraction actually holds right. other otherwise uh, basically uh, working in um uh working with this uh this kind of sets of probability measures uh is useful because uh so it, it was developed originally because um people who who were studying uh, the, the the very fun foundational aspects of statistics were saying oh like for example bayesian updating requires you to specify one single prior and of course from the from uh, from the application point of view it, it doesn't really matter right because uh, eventually uh, if you if you have enough data, data prior is swamped by the by the data. But uh, from a more philosophical point of view, you shouldn't be able to do that. Like you you cannot express your initial uh, exactly. beliefs. Yeah, and therefore that's not actually the, so. The, it's not the goal to to restrict uh, to restrict to a single prior, but to to carry on to a set of prior that now uh, that that now like that, that are. That all this set of uh, of uh, prior encompasses all the data that we collected uh, as we as we as our analysis go on. Does does that uh, answer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, as in, instead of a single prior, you end up with a small enough set of possible. Yes, priors, that's that's right? true. That's true. And all, th there is a whole a whole literature in which. Um, uh, basically, let me go back to the to the very beginning, in which uh, the, the the triple uh, the, the triple where you have uh, uh, I, I can't find it. Basically, the, the the generalization of the triple where you have uh, omega uh, f and the and the whole set mm -hmm. uh, that one is called dinking space, and it has to yeah yeah, yeah it has to uh, to fulfill other other requirements. But then, and then once you, you if you are able to get to that uh, to that space, and then you are you are in a nicer spot because you have a lot of results that you can actually use. So. Okay, and I have one more question, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not 
it might be because I didn't fully understand your or your ergodic theorems. Yeah, so sorry. for me, if a process is ergodic, right, then mm -hmm. it can't be decomposed further, right? If, for example, okay. imagine an ergodic decomposition of a stationary process that has a few extreme yes. points, right? But here, um, can you comment a little bit on this, uh, the ergodic theorems for this, uh, this l limiting set, basically? Um, if I understood it, I, I don't know if I understood it correctly, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the idea is that, um, uh, so we, we want to, we want to, um, to find something similar, uh, to what, or to what's already out there. Um, but of course, once you start working with, uh, sets of probabilities, uh, you, you need extra assumptions. Uh, because otherwise things may be, may go wrong, and that's that's uh, inherent with uh, with working with uh, pro lower probabilities and in general sets of probabilities. So, so you're right. Uh, it's uh, it may be difficult to separate uh, the the latent portion of of uh, of the of the ergodic theory of the sorry ergodic process. Uh, but um, the goal here again was was just to 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 show that there is a, a an ergodic, th there can be an ergodic theory associated with uh, with the limit of uh, of updates of uh, sets of probability measures. Uh, okay. So that's yeah. And if you have any more specific questions, please email me. I'm I'm very happy to to answer. Sure. Thank you so much for the great talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for for listening. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? <clears throat> Well, it's more <clears throat> a question of language. Mm -hmm. What, I mean, kinematics and mechanics are taken from physics, but in your context, can you distinguish between the two? And a second question that is not connected, but it is about their godicity. If I understand the definition, it's independent of initial values. And that has also somehow to do with memory or memory less processes. So apparently, all these concepts are a little bit, you know, <laughs> not, they're not mixed in the positive sense. Mixing is sometimes good process, but uh, <laughs> okay, I'm sorry if I have a very convoluted question here. No, not at all. So to, to answer your, your first question, um, the, to, to my knowledge, there is no real connection between uh, kinematics and be, between the, this probability kinematics procedure and uh, physics. So it's just, it's just called probability kinematics because Jeffrey, so the, the, first, uh, the, the first person who, who actually thought of this, this way of updating called it that way. Uh, I, it may be that uh, that uh, in his mind there, there were some some connections with uh, with respect to physics, and uh, to be to be completely honest, I didn't read his PhD thesis because it was from the from the 50s 60s, so the notation is is cumbersome. It's uh, the, the 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 English is difficult, so I, I cannot really answer properly to your first question. And to the second one, I think you're absolutely right. We we don't really. Uh, we didn't thought of, of mixing and uh, and uh, memoryless memoryless properties, but that could be that could and should be inspected in the future and and added to 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 our to our work. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, other questions? Yeah, okay then. Yeah, thanks again for the nice talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so our next speaker will be at four by uh, TV Shayan. So see you later. Yeah.
this is going to take. Yeah, all right. So maybe we should go ahead and start then. Go ahead and start. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay thank you. So uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Shayan Mukherjee from uh, Duke University, who will be talking about learning dynamic systems. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, first of all, thank you for the uh, for the invitation, and it's been a lot of fun listening to the, these earlier talks. Uh, so I'm going to talk, you know, about learning dynamical systems and. Um, this joint work with several colleagues. Um, and we're gonna start with an example. So this is, uh, I just wanted to at least give one concrete example. Um, one of my colleagues here at Duke is uh, a really exceptional uh, engineer and biologist. And what he's made here, what I'm showing you is a fake gut, right? So this is a bioreactor. And in it, you can basically take, uh, put in, for example, fecal samples, and you can see how the microbiome is changing, right? How these communities of microbes, how, you know, change, and you can control this. So you can really look at how quickly they're changing um, and things like that, right? And so these are the data you get. These are these types of time series, and then you can basically make, try to make inferences from these time series. And, and one of the things that we look at and we think about in terms of this problem is, let me just, sorry, one second. Let me, Get rid of one thing. Bring this back. Okay. Is that you have some true state of the system and it gets, there's biological things happening. Those are my variation W1. Okay. And then there's also some technical noise. And then I have observations and these data accounts. And what I want to do is, for example, break down the, uh, the biological variation versus a technical variation. Okay. Now, 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 basic question here, I'm just writing down a model. A very basic question is, under what conditions can I learn a model, right? What, when can I learn a model? When can I not learn a model, right? And, and so this leads us to uh, a very classical uh, question, and, and I'm going to frame it in terms of statistical learning theory, which is, you know, the classic regression setting is I have a set of random variables x and y. Let's say y is uh, uh, univariate. And so I'm getting data from a joint distribution. These are all drawn IID. And what do I often want to do? I want to get a good, I want to estimate a good function. And what's a good function? It's an accurate map from X to Y. Okay. So, you know, for most data sets being drawn from the joint distribution, Y should be about equal to F of X. Okay. Okay. So this is a classic question of under what conditions can we learn, right? And it depends on the algorithm we use to infer the function. And sometimes we need to put constraints on this algorithm. So if this is my following algorithm, right? I just put a delta function on each of the x i's and y i, this will do terribly, right? Because anything not in the data set is going to be zero. So a very standard way this was uh, studied is you put constraints on this class of functions, right? For example, square integrable functions or something, right? And now you can have a learning algorithm where I minimize my error, my loss. Right, and that gives me a hat, and I want to compare it to, for example, the best function in the class. Okay, again, here's just an example. Uh, on the right, I have a second order polynomial. On the left, I have a much higher order polynomial. And if you notice, if I just perturb my data a little bit, the second order polynomial is not going to change much, but the higher order is going to change a ton. Okay, um, so there's this there's this very classic idea. I have a hypothesis space H. And I'm going to look at the supremum norm, and I'm going to try to cover it. So n h epsilon is a minimum number, right? Such that for every function in h, there exists some function 
uh, that, that covers it, okay? And the metric entropy is nothing but the log of this covering number. And a formal definition of learnability is that as n goes to infinity, right, a uh, log of the metric entropy is going to zero, okay? So this is a very kind of classic uh, condition. And you know, under these conditions, we can often say something with high probability about the function you're estimating from your data to the best function in the class. Now, how do I think about this when I think about dynamics? Okay, so that's what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of, um, uh, for the, I guess, rest of today, okay. So let's say X is my phase space. X sub T is a true state of the weather at time T, for example. And then I have an observation space and Y sub T is my observation at time T. Uh, and please, if you have any questions, just chime in. Okay, so what we have access to are the observations. Okay, so there are many questions you can ask. You can ask what's a true state. This is a problem of filtering. There's a problem of um, prediction. Can I predict what's gonna happen at the next time inst instance? And then there's this problem of, you know, can I infer the rules governing the evo evolution of the system? So this is model selection, parameter estimation, system identification, right? There are many names for this. And this is, let's focus on this question. Okay, so I have these variables, X and Y, and, um, and they're gonna be related. So we're gonna assume that this joint process, X, T, Y, T has, it's stationary. For example, a classic idea is it's Markov and you have conditional independence, right? So if you have this type of model, this is a very classic uh, instance of what's called a hidden Markov model, right? So here I'm just giving you um, an example of it, right? You have these stochastic state updates, that's for X, and then you have this observation process on Y, and this is a standard picture that we have where uh, X is Markov and Y is um, it's my observation process, okay, great. Now, often we think about these processes as stochastic, right? Now, if, if X has positive variance, it's stochastic, what happens if it has zero variance? What happens if it's deterministic? In weather modeling, as well as in, um, you know, uh, microbial ecology, both, deterministic and stochastic methods are used. And today we're gonna to focus on the deterministic study. Okay, so I have, um, the, the way I'm gonna think about the model is you have a space X, it's a complete separable metric space with a Braille sigma algebra, sigma X. <coughs> T are my dynamics and they're indexed by theta, okay? So each theta is a different dynamic. So you can think of this as a family of dynamical systems. It's a measurable map. Mu sub theta is an invariant measure. So it's invariant with respect to T sub theta. Okay, so that, that's the concept that I, I, you know, I want to state. And this is a measure preserving system and it's ergodic, okay? We will talk later on about what you might be able to do if things aren't ergodic. I think that's very interesting, but for now these are ergodic and this family of systems, I'm going to reduce down this quadruple down to a double, right? which is T theta and mu theta. Okay. Now there's also an observation process, right? So this is a conditional likelihood of the observation process. So you can also think of G as a map from uh, theta cross X cross Y to positive real, okay? So this is my likelihood of, uh, of observing a sequence Y zero to N, right? Conditioned on theta. And this assumes that your initial condition is X zero. And sometimes we often will want to uh, not worry about the initial condition. So we might integrate that out and look at the following marginal likelihood, okay? okay. So here's one example of this. You just draw an initial condition and then your X's are the logistic map. And then your observation process Y is a logistic map plus noise. So one question is, given these observations, can we guess what theta star is, what the true parameter is, okay? So theta is a parameter space. You have a law of stationary hidden Markov model. We may want to distinguish parameter theta star, right, uh, from the other ones. And so can you, one question is, can we consistently estimate theta star? So, so one caveat is 
identifiability. So we could have two models with different parameters, but they have the same law. Y is the same under both. So we're gonna deal with that by using this theta bracket uh, to denote just a set of all parameters that have the same law. Okay. So you can think of an estimation procedure as a sequence of measurable functions from our data to the parameter space. And it's consistent if theta hat converges to theta bracket star, it almost surely, okay? So I'm gonna start by talking actually about a frequentist approach, which is ma maximum likelihood. And then I'm gonna start um, shift over to uh, Bayesian questions and Bayesian approaches for inference. Okay. This is what I just said, maximum likelihood Bayesian estimation. We're gonna talk about maximum likelihood and Bayesian inference, okay? So maximum likelihood. Okay, if a maximum exists, then the maximum likelihood estimator is one that just, you know, arg max theta, p theta. So I okay. have a question, yeah. actually. Sure, like, uh, yeah. I just wanted to, so when you defined your family of dynamical systems, you used the parameter theta, right? Um, mm -hmm. But then after that, you're still talking about a hidden Markov model. So I was just wondering, like, which framework are you in? Are you in a stationary ergodic framework or do you have, if you go backwards a little bit, uh, where you had your dynamical Oh, shoot. Oh, sorry. Well, that's okay. Let me, let me uh, pull it back up. Sorry about that. No, 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 that's fine. Uh, okay. Okay, good. And let me get back to sharing. Where do you want me to stop? Um, where you have your family of dynamical systems. Okay. might've been a little bit before this. Yeah, I know exactly where you're talking about. Right here, right? So here you have a uh, parameter space theta and then you have your measurable maps and, and whatnot. But, but then later you use theta for uh, your dynamics of the hidden Markov model or so- Right, right. So yeah. yeah. From now on out in this talk, forget about hidden Markov models. Okay, good. So this right. is this is your um, stochastic processes that you're considering. These are the stochastic processes that I'm okay. considering. From here on out, no more hidden Markov models. And my uh, my dynamics, my state updates are gonna be deterministic. Okay. Okay, but there's a noisy observation process. Okay? Mm -hmm. It, very soon, I'm going to evoke hidden Markov models, but uh, the results I'm going to talk about are not for hidden Markov models. Okay, so here I'm just defining an approximate maximum likelihood estimator, right? Just to kind of be rigorous, what I mean by maximum likelihood. Okay. Okay. So the consistency of maximum likelihoods have been studied a lot. Uh, Baum and Petrie, Leroy. And there's a paper uh, by uh, Dirk, Moulin, and Olsen and Van Handel um, that talked about consistency for MLE for infinite dimensional hidden Markov models, okay? And so these are very general spaces. Now, all of these results relied on strong stochastic mixing conditions. So being able to apply these results to a deterministic dynamical system is, uh, well, not possible, okay? Uh, and I think this is going back to your question, right, about the hidden Markov model. So th this is my map, right? Uh, it's deterministic dynamics. Uh, and if you look at this, a Markov transition kernel is gonna be degenerate. So what can you do, okay? So let's say we wanna establish some notion of consistency for classes of dynamical systems, okay? So there are two questions. One, can we do it? And, the, and two, do the results that we get apply to any dynamical system? Because 
It would be very sad if they don't. Okay, so certain things you're gonna need, okay? So if I have a stochastic process, uh, what I mean by strong mixing is the supremum, right? Of the joint minus a product. Uh, and this alpha S is gonna go to zero as S goes to infinity. And I think we saw something very similar to this uh, in the first talk of the day. Here's a notion of dynamic mixing, right? Is if I state the above, but with respect to the invariant measure. Okay. Okay. So the first thing we can do is ask, well, there were six conditions that were required to show consistency of hidden Markov models. So we can just say, do you need the similar conditions? Uh, or what are the analogs of this for a dynamical system? Okay. Just some notation. Um, let's see, gamma sub theta y is going to be the supremum of my observation process. And uh, there's going to be this max of zero and log x. Okay, these are just things that'll show up. Okay. Now, so the first thing is um, you want your system to be ergodic. That seems kind of important. So for a measure preserving system, what do you mean by mixing? It's either weakly mixing right, which we write down in terms of uh, iterating the map, looking at the joint under the iteration of the map versus um, the, uh, the, the products of the marginals. And again, this is what I mean by strongly mixing. Let me actually get out of this. This is what I mean by strongly mixing. This is what we mean by weakly mixing, okay? Okay. You need integrability at your theta star, right? So. Uh, at the true parameter, you don't want your like log likelihood to explode. Okay, so that's that's one condition. And for every theta prime that's not in your uh, in the true theta star, right? There needs to be a neighborhood of theta type prime such that again you have uh, this integrability. So you need it near theta star and you need it away from theta star. Okay, you need some type of continuity. Okay, so the function, uh, the map from theta to p theta should be upper semi-continuous. So conditions one through four that I just stated are very similar conditions that you need for HMMs because these are again, just kind of uh, regularity conditions, okay? Conditions one through three are easy to establish for dynamical systems. Condition four is hard. It's, uh, it's not trivial to verify and you need sufficient things uh, sufficient conditions on the continuous dependence of mu theta and theta. Uh, these conditions, let's look back at four a little bit, right? This condition four, right? In dynamical systems uh, is often reduced to what is called statistical stability of a dynamical system. So you, you need this control, okay? There's some extra conditions that we need now for dynamics, uh, which we didn't, which you don't need for hidden Markov model. So you need a mixing condition. You need decay and correlations, right? Um, that there's some L big enough that if I iterate the map, right? I can basically break it up into a product structure. Uh, you know, an obvious reason why you need something like this is if there's no decay and correlations, it's like you're getting one sample and doing statistics is gonna be pretty much impossible, okay? Okay, so again, this is just defining some of these constants and I'll just kind of just keep this up here for a second. But this is really, really the main idea, right? And, and this is again, a, you know, this is a mixing condition. Okay. So a very classic way of thinking about um, MLE and inference is and, and the way you, you, I'll come back to this at the end of the talk, a lot of the things that we're gonna talk about at the beginning, I, I think it's very natural to think about these kind of like as, as a large deviation principle. So what I'm saying is that you need an exponential difference in what's going on at the true parameter versus the non-true parameters, right? And this is basically what we're saying, right? Uh, that, that, that at theta star, right? If I look at the, 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 the um, the likelihood, right, right, then it's going to be greater than zero, and for any other theta, it's going to be less than zero, right. So you really want this exponential difference, for example, in the log likelihood. Okay. 
Condition five comes for free in HMMs. Condition five is the most difficult to check. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to this. Again, condition five seems hall, strong, but it holds under fairly general conditions. And we'll, we'll come back to this. Okay, so this is our uh, one of our results. Suppose that uh, my family of dynamical systems is a parameterized family, right, on X script X with this observation process. If these conditions hold, then any approximate MLE is consistent at theta star. Okay. So it's a, I, we found it interesting that conditions C4 through six were not examined in dynamical systems theory. Let me flash those again. This exponential identifiability, the mixing. Okay. Now, now, now one and this semi-continuity. Now, one can ask why were they not studied in uh, in standard dynamics, and because people didn't think about that, you know, in detail within the dynamics community of doing inference, right? And these are conditions that show up very much if you're interested in inference. Okay. Um, now we can relate C4 through C6 to conditions on dynamical systems that have been examined, right? And this, a lot of this comes from the work of, you know, people like Lysing Young or uh, Bowen and Sinai and Ruel. And I'll come back to this in a little bit, okay? Okay. So if I have a space of Borel probability measures on X, I can think of this topology of weak convergence. So for any function F of X that's bounded and continuous, right? What I mean by the limit as N goes to infinity of these two integrals are the same. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna mean by weak convergence. A family of dynamical systems has statistical stability if the map from theta to the invariant measure is continuous with respect to this weak topology. Okay, so this is what we mean uh, by statistical stability. And this is basically what we need in terms of the uh, lower semi-continuous property. Okay, if X and theta are compact, and the maps t from theta cross x to x, and the observation sequence are continuous, then t theta, then this uh, our dynamical system has statistical stability, and the upper semi-continuity of the likelihood holds at C4. Okay. Now, now there's a really important concept in dynamics, and I'll get back to versions of this, uh, but this is called joins or joinings. Okay. If I give a finite partition of x, okay. I describe the join of partitions C0 and C1 as basically C0 uh, wedge C1, okay? And, and then you can construct the sequence of joins basically going back in time, okay? Okay, so what you need is you need, these are my partitions, okay? This is going to act very much like the measure and I'm going to need this to mix. So if I take a set A, right, I iterate my map going back M plus L and look at it B, right? This needs to be bounded by some constant, mu theta A, V theta B. So this is nothing but my mixing condition. Okay, then, and what I'm talking about is mixing with respect to a partition, okay? And the reason why we're doing things with respect to partitions is that because this is a deterministic system, right? You're really thinking about this. Uh, it's very natural to think about it in terms of partitions rather than, uh, than the measure, okay? There's also some regularity of partitions, right? So this is this distance, beta, min, m, and n. So basically they're saying that if I, you know, there's some m and n that are big enough, right? That if I go far enough out, uh, then I have this regularity of the partitions, okay? And then this is just saying my observations are regular, that my uh, observation process is not exploding. That's all this is saying. Um, yeah, okay. So if you have a family of dynamical systems with observation densities, then there exists a partition C of X such that M1 through M3 are satisfied. And so therefore, uh, C5, the mixing property hold, holds, okay. Now, the identifiability you could get basically is a large deviation result. And I'll, and I'll talk about large deviations later on, but, uh, but this is really thinking about this as a large deviation. Um, this is L12 is just my regularity of observations. That's all, okay. 
So if you have a family of Holder continuous dynamical systems with observation densities G, if the large deviation property L1 and the regularity property L2 are satisfied, then you get this exponential identifiability, right? So you can observe and get the right answer at this exponential scale. Okay. So now you can ask, okay, you gave me some theorems and that's, that's wonderful, but uh, does this hold for any dynamical systems, okay? So we're gonna look at two systems that we know have good deterministic mixing properties, right? And so they're very natural candidates. And what I'll tell you is if what we prove doesn't work for these, these, these two systems, then what we proved is nonsense, right? So that was kind of our motivation, okay? So a classic system is the axiom A system. I have a Riemannian manifold with a diffeomorphism F. Then F is an axiom A system if a few things hold, right? First, a non-wandering set, omega of F is hyperbolic and compact. And the set of periodic points of F is dense in omega of F. Okay, so this is, let's talk about this a little bit more. A point is non-wandering. If we take any neighborhood and we iterate the map, right? And intersect it with that neighborhood, right? Then that is not the null set. Okay, so basically it means it's not gonna run away, okay? This hyperbolicity is really important. So what does this say? I, I, I look at my map, I look at the tangent of that map at, at a point X, and I can break this up into two different sets. One set is expanding. So if I iterate the map, it's gonna expand. The other part of it is uh, contract, right? And that's what I mean by S and U, okay? So there's this very specific differential structure, okay? So, the, and this is what we mean by a hyperbolic system, okay? Axiom A families. If I have a parameterized family of diffeomorphisms and this map is holder continuous, right? And there's an alpha for which F theta has this kind of continuity property, okay? And for each theta, omega theta is an axiom A attractor, right? It's topological and mixing. And for each theta, the measure mu sub theta is what's called a unique Sinai Ruel Bowen measure. And I will talk about this in a lot more detail in probably about five minutes. Okay. If the above conditions are met, then I have a parameterized family of axiom A systems. And for axiom A systems, if the observation are integrable, C2, C3 hold, and you have regularity and the second L2, then the MLE is consistent, okay? Um, I'm going to talk about shifts of finite type a little bit later again in the talk, but uh, the way I want you to think about, okay, so XMA systems are uh, one system that we know they mix. They have these nice um, properties and they're very classic in that this is a differential structure. It's, 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 it's nice in that way. Now, Another way people think about and study dynamical systems is what's the analog of a Markov chain, which is basically, uh, you can think of this as a topological Markov chain, okay? And this is where shifts of finite type come from. And this is a very discrete type world. So I have a finite alphabet. I can define a matrix T of zeros and ones, right? And basically, if you have a zero in this matrix, then it's, a for, it's, it's forbidden, this map is forbidden. And then I have a shift map where I just move over um, by one, okay? And then you can define a metric or a potential function which has some smoothness. And there's something which we'll talk about very soon, I'm gonna talk about a lot more, is a Gibbs measure. So this Gibbs measure is a limiting uh, measure, right? It is well-defined and shift of finite types. And this is often called also the SRB measure, okay? And this is basically the stationary distribution, okay? X is a mixing shift of finite type. It's continuous parameterized family of Gibbs measure. If the observation satisfies integrability, then you have an approximate maximum likely, okay? I'm gonna now talk about Bayesian inference and talk about in much more detail Gibbs measures. And I'm gonna try to give you some intuition about, you know, what they are, okay? So I have a data generating process, classic Bayesian inference. You have a parameter theta, you have a likelihood, you have a prior, you have a marginal likelihood. Uh, and this is Bayes rule, which uh, in the previous talk, McKelly did not like, but you know, 
It's okay. Some of us still do use Bayes' rule. Um, classic example, my data are coming from a Bernoulli, right? I'm just doing coin flips. I put a beta prior and then I get a posterior. You can compute a closed form. That's really exciting. What's posterior consistency? You want your posterior to concentrate around the true generating process theta star okay, in this neighborhood. And this is what strong posterior consistency means. Now, the classical studying is I have a complete metric space with a Borel sigma algebra. I have some y-valued process of a parameter theta on the space. This could be infinite dimensional. I have a prior and I have a posterior. And typically in the IID, you have the sequences drawn IID with some density. And you ask, you know, what happens to the posterior as n goes to infinity, right? Does it go to the right answer? Is it consistent? So what we mean by posterior consistency is you have a theta zero and a prior. It's consistent for all open neighborhoods. U is if I look at theta, cut out U, right? Uh, look at, uh, and given my sequence, right? Basically showing that this is going to zero, okay? Almost surely. Okay, oh, sorry, wrong direction. Okay, so the first kind of proof of consistency was by Dube in 1949, and he used this very, very pretty uh, Martingale argument to show uh, consistency. Um, now, then there were results for uh, finite dimensional MLE in the IID case, right? This is by, uh, by Schwartz, basically, again, showing consistency. So, you know, what are we looking at here? The important thing is the log ratio of, your, of the true, right, theta zero versus another theta zero, that has to go away fast, right? So this is, this is, this is basically testing these log ratios, right? And these two are just saying that, you know, your phenomena, right, is happening at an exponential scale. And these phi ends are my test functions. These are the functions that I use to test um, whether I'm getting the right answer or not. Now, there's a wonderful paper by, uh, by, by Diaconis and Friedman in the 1990s where they started looking at the infinite, infinite dimensional case when we were doing uh, posterior consistency, but your models are infinite dimensional. And these are examples are things like uh, various types of polia urns, right? Or Dirichlet, Dirichlet processes. And basically they showed inconsistency results, okay? Now there's been extensive results in the past uh, 20 years, uh, a lot of it by uh, Ad van der and uh, Shubhashish Kushal, they have a wonderful book and people have studied rates of convergence, different metrics, there's been a lot done. But what happens when things are not IID, right? Let's say we have something stationary, but not IID, I have a theta. What do I do then? If I give you a prior, can we think of a posterior? And can we show consistency? So again, example was a hidden Markov model, but, but what happens if things are deterministic, as I said before, right? So you might have <laughs> seen the slide earlier, right? Again, this is my deterministic dynamics. This is how I'm setting it up, okay? But now, and then my observation noise. So here's an example. This is the example I actually started with in this talk. This is called a dynamic linear model, right? So it's basically like a common filter, except for the state updates and the observation process, right? Or ch are changing over time. And this is actually uh, exactly what we use to, to model those bioreactors, okay? okay? Okay, so let's set this up. I have an observation system on Y, right? And T is a generating process. T, oh, that's my map. And nu is my stationary measure, okay? So I'm gonna try to track this T. What am I gonna track it with? with some family of dynamical systems. So I can write it in two ways. I can write S theta cross X, or I can index S by theta. And since these are the same, this is my, uh, my, 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 my map, family of maps. And then I can just look at the loss between my sequence X and Y. So Y is what I observe, 
X is what I'm generating from data, right? And this is just my loss, right? So here I told you X is uh, generated by just iterating S theta. Y is my observation. Okay. Now, now this is what some people call generalized Bayes or the Gibbs posterior. You take your loss, negative of your loss, you exponentiate it, multiply it by your prior and normalize it. So this is called the Gibbs posterior. If L were the log likelihood, this would be nothing but base. This would be exactly base, okay? Now I can ask a question. Well, does this converge to something unique, right? Because if it doesn't, that's bad, right? Because, well, we want to use this as our posterior. And does it concentrate around the generating process? So these are the two questions that we really want to focus on. Okay, so the Gibbs posterior is a decision theoretic perspective of Bayes. Like I said, if it's a negative log likelihood, standard, uh, standard Bayes. And it's supposedly robust to misspecification. And again, this uh, Huber type robust statistics. Now, often you see people add an extra parameter fee here to try to calibrate this likelihood, okay? Okay. Uh, now, if I have a map, if I'm given some, um, some um, Borel sigma algebra X, I have a map S and a potential function F. There's a measure mu naught, right? Such that G and X mu naught F has this following property, okay? And the Gibbs measure is a limit point of the sequence, okay? The Gibbs measure was heavily studied by Bowen, uh, Sinai, and Ruel. And a lot of what they did was basically relating uh, dynamics to statistical physics. That, that's kind of the real impetus and the motivation for this, okay? And you can look at this, this looks a lot like the base, the Gibbs posterior, right? It's just with a very particular type of potential function, which is um, the loss, okay? Now I'm gonna tell you about shifts of finite type, but I'm gonna write it in a slightly different way. I have an alphabet, right? And I'm gonna look at this, this space sigma is just a to the z on the lattice. I have a left shift operator, which I told you about before. I have a set of forbidden uh, words, right? Finite number of, this should be words, I'm sorry. So this again is a shift of finite type. Uh, you can also think about it is you, you have the shift map, right? It's encoded by matrix A, where if a shift is allowed, you get a one, otherwise it's zero. This is what we call a topological Markov chain or a one-step shift of finite type. You can similarly define M-step shift of finite type. And it's mixing if and only if uh, for some N, right? A N contains all positive entries. So again, very much what you have in the classic Markov chain setting, right? But this is for this uh, topological Markov. This is again what I just said. Okay. If you have this potential function, a measure mu on the sequence has a Gibbs property for F. If there exists a K greater than one and P script P, which we is typically called the pressure such that you have this property. So this is your measure. This is your Gibbs measure. This is your sequence. And basically this is this exponential. Now, now if you stare at this and I'll come back to this later on, what, what is the basic idea here in the Gibbs measure is you're getting something at an exponential scale. And, and I'll come back to that, okay? So there's a beautiful theorem by Bowen is if you have a mixing shift of finite type and your um, potential function is holder continuous, there's a unique Gibbs measure, okay? We will use this. This is what I just told you. F is called the potential, and this P is called its pressure. Okay. So let's define a model class. We have families of dependent processes as follows. Theta is a compact metric space. F theta are a continuously parameterized family of holder continuous potential functions. And mu sub theta is my corresponding family of Gibbs measures. So what am I telling you? For each theta, right, there is a mu sub theta which is a Gibbs measure, okay? So one of the reasons why this shift of finite type and why this is interesting is Markov chains are a special case. So we can actually study Markov chains of 
arbitrary um, you know, lag, right? Using, using these results. Okay. Observation densities, Borel measure on Y. Again, measurable function, integral, just, just some integrability probability. And we'll often write just g theta dot x. Okay. Okay. We're going to need some, again, like I told you before, integrability, regularity on g. Okay. So this is what we call a hidden Gibbs process. So we're generating data from a shift, mixing shift of finite type. That's, that's exactly what we're having here, the sigma sub k of x. And then you throw this observation process on it, right? Um, take the product of this, you integrate it with respect to the Gibbs measure, right? And that's my marginal likelihood. Okay. This is just writing it out as a hierarchical model because I think this is a habit of almost any Bayesian statistician is to write everything as a hierarchical model. But anyways, yeah. this is my posterior. This is my Gibbs posterior, right? And uh, with respect to the marginal likelihood, and we can ask, is this consistent? How does it work? Can we say something about posterior consistency? So if my prior is fully supported on, on theta, right? Uh, then for any neighborhood mu, u of theta zero, right? Then what happens? You're getting this posterior consistency almost surely for that, for that family, okay? So more general setting, theta as before, script x as before, continuous loss, an arbitrary stationary or chaotic process. And then the, again, this is my loss. This is my Gibbs posterior, right? Um, you were showing that this thing has some meaning, okay? So now, now, now the thing that you really need to look at, and if you stare at this, right? You, you, get, you basically ask the question, well, what can go wrong? What can go wrong is if this normalization constant or this partition function goes nuts. Right? So somehow at some scale, we have to have control over this partition function. And if you stare at it, what you need is you need to control the log of the partition function at a scale of one over n. Okay? And you need to show this limit exists with probability. Okay. This is a very important concept, which is that of adjoining. If I have two dynamical systems, T and S, and T has stationary measure mu, and S has stationary measure nu, then the joining of T and S is a probability measure on a product space on lambda on X cross Y, and the marginals respectively, okay? And it has to be invariant to the product structure of the map. Let's, let's compare that to a coupling, right? A coupling of two random variables, X and prime, is any pair of random variables, Y, Y prime, that are living on the joint space and have the same marginals. So what's a joining? A joining is a coupling that respects the dynamics. So uh, these mu and nu, nu have to be invariant on the product map, okay? Okay. Another way of thinking about joinings, this is my, uh, my mixing shift of finite type, okay? A joining of X with Y, this is my observation process. It's a stationary bivariate process UV, right? on X cross Y such that U is in P of X sigma, right? It's, it's, a, it's one of my shifts of finite type and V is gonna be equal to Y in distribution, okay? So we're gonna denote the set of joinings by script J, okay? So here's a point. If my prior is fully supported and my loss has regularity and integrability uh, conditions, there's gonna exist a lower semi-continuous phi such that with probability one, the limit of the log of the partition at the right scale is actually gonna, uh, is gonna have a um, variational problem. It's gonna be basically set, set by a variational, uh, yeah. Now, what we'll see later on, this phi is a rate function and it's a rate function in the large deviation sense. Okay, so if I define the limiting cost as L D uh, lambda, Right? So this is nothing but my, my loss scaled. Okay, um, and then there's another term, which if I give you two uh, probability measures, pi and mu on script X, and I look at a finite measurable partition of X, okay? 
I'm going to define L mu pi with respect to my partition psi as basically the entropy, right? And what, what this is letting us to do, do is define some notion of, 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 of KL divergence or um, a relative entropy, right? And again, because these are deterministic measures, everything is done in partitions. Okay. So this is our statement. What you should do is look at your loss and look at the Kale divergence with respect to your prior, right? And minimize over all joinings, okay? And, uh, and this infimum is what you are getting in terms of the log partition function. Now, if you stare at this right here, right? This is a variational problem. It's an optimization problem over joinings. Now, if our data were IID, one way you can write Bayes rule, right? Which is your posterior given your data is look at the loss with respect to your, um, yeah, look at the loss, right? Look at the KL divergence uh, with respect to your prior and give me back the distribution that's gonna minimize my loss and be as close as possible to pi, right? And so again, this is Bayes rule written as a variational problem. And if you stare at that, these, this is the dynamics, exact dynamics analog of this, okay? Uh, so if you have a Gibbs prior, this, this variational problem, it's actually the measure, it's what's called the pressure, okay? And what you can show is for all epsilon greater than zero, the distance between the, uh, our theta star, right? Which is what it's concentrating around. And uh, the true generating process is gonna be one, right? So it's converging to the true generating process. Now, now what's interesting is the tools we use to prove this, right? So we use what something called the thermodynamic formalism, uh, which was developed by Sinai, Ruhl, and Bowen, their theory of joinings, which comes from Furstenberg, and some aspects of random thermodynamic formalism, which is from Kiefer. So this idea, this, this, this uh, thermodynamic formalisms and shifts of finite type, it lets us think the Gibbs posterior as a two-stage process. First, you solve the limiting variational problem. Then you analyze this problem to think about consistency. It's a general framework and set of tools from the thermodynamic formalism for analyzing asymptotic behavior of Gibbs posterior. It, it's, it's really remarkable and you can almost take results out of uh, Rufus Bowen's book and use them for posterior, um, to prove posterior consistency. You need a little bit more work, but it's, 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 it's pretty remarkable how, how, how that worked out. Um, there are lots of statistics questions. There are dynamics questions. I'm going to come back to these in a second. But um, um, there's a way that we've been thinking about it differently recently, OK? And uh, at the talk I'm going to, the stuff I'm going to talk about right now is some work done by a grad student at Duke, uh, Lang Xuanzu. Uh, OK, so we knew, well, we didn't know. We strongly suspected that uh, this idea of Gibbs measures would work. And we strongly suspected they would work because we knew that it was at, the, at an exponential scale, right? Um, so, so then we started saying, okay, well, you know, how about we take a step back and say, okay, this exponential scale, that's the actual really important idea. So can I think about posterior inference, especially for um, in the Bayesian setting as some type of large deviation principle, okay? so. Um, a sequence of measures that satisfies a large deviation principle with rate function i, if for any uh, Borel subset, you have this inequality, okay? Right, so we're looking log of u, right? And there's a minus inf, minus inf i. And, and, and really at the end of the day, what is this saying? This say, is saying that I can observe something at an exponential scale, right? So this is, this is you know, large deviation principle. There's this related Laplace principle. I have a sequence of random variables. And for any uh, C functions um, continuous with you know, coefficient b, I, I, have, uh, I have this again. I can observe something at an exponential scale. Okay, And again, i is here the rate function. OK, now, when you have 
when you have something at this exponential scale, right? If I have a measurable function f and mu as a measure, you can write down the following variational formula, right? Which is, this is my measurable function f. I'm looking at my loss. This is a Kale divergence between lambda and mu, right? And this was very similar to what I was looking at before, right? In terms of my joinings, right? But now here it's, it's a stochastic setting. And when is this influence gonna be attained? It's gonna be attained right here, right? Okay. Now, this idea of shifts of finite type and the Gibbs measure was really, uh, I, like I said, one of the people who drove it was, um, was Bowen, right? Now, now, one of the things that was really uh, impactful, and this is work by, by Lysing Young, and what she did was she said, well, you know, I can think about a lot of this stuff in terms of Markov chains, right? And I can think about this very much in terms of mixing results on Markov chains. I can really think about this in terms of, you know, uh, excursions, returns, and things like that, right? So, so there's a large deviations approach very much in what Lysing Young did in the way she studied dynamical systems, right? And there, this is a system, it's called Young Towers, right? And what's it saying? You have a system T, okay? So that if I take any sequence X1 through XK and any sequence of numbers N1 through NK, again, there's a sequence. So what am I doing? As I iterate, longer, right? This is less than epsilon. If I iterate more, right? This is less than epsilon. So basically, as I increase and increase these iterations, right? I always have to be able to find an n and a p such that it's going to be smaller than epsilon, okay? So this, a dynamical system that satisfies this uh, is called a Young Tower. Okay. Now, if you have this type of Young Tower, Okay, H mu is a Kolmogorov Sinai entropy. This is nothing but the entropy that I talked about earlier, right? This is my map. These are my iterates. Okay, now let's say that uh, this H mu of t is less than infinity, right? And for every phi, it's 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 also smooth. Then basically you have this large deviation result. Okay, and. Uh, now, what's interesting is, so you, you, you saw that the Bayesian results that I talked to you about were for a discrete setting, right? It was a shift of finite type. I didn't say anything about, um, well, I didn't tell you anything about axiom A systems because we couldn't prove anything about axiom A. Well, we didn't prove things about axiom A systems. Now, let's say I have an axiom A system, just as I told you before. Basically using, again, axiom A families. Okay. What is it? A parameters family of diffeomorphisms. The map from theta F theta is C1 continuous. I have axiom A attractors. And this is called a volume lemma. Okay. And what does this volume lemma really do? Is it states basically you have this exponential scale. Right, and this is basically this right here is parameterizing the, the 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 family of dynamical systems, and this volume lemma is basically saying you have this exponential scale. Once you have this exponential scale, you have a large deviation result. Okay, and so for new almost every y, right, you have this large deviation result. Now, no, 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 no. One of the I I'm, I haven't put it in yet, uh, and this is. Uh, Lang Xuan is working on the paper right now. But one of the reasons why we want to try to think about this um, in the context of this large deviation principle is basically using this large deviation idea, we can prove uh, posterior consistency for uh, shifts of finite type, uh, axiom A system. So that's really nice because one's a kind of discrete world. The other one's a more continuous world, right? So that was, that was nice. We also uh, can do this for um, continuous time stochastic processes, right? Um, and one of the things I've been very interested in is there are these really, really nice results by people like Andrew Stewart and others who uh, studied inverse problems on SDEs. 
and doing Bayesian inference for these SDEs. Okay, and um, and one thing that 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 I, I suspect this large deviation idea will let us do is to hopefully have some coherent way of thinking both about deterministic discrete time systems as well as continuous time systems. So again, that's something that we're going uh, towards. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, dimension reduction and dynamics. Uh, this is also sometimes called model uh, reduction. And then I, I didn't have time to put in the slides, but I'm gonna spend maybe about um, 10 minutes talking about uh, trying to minimize joinings, okay? okay? Okay, so what am I talking about? Please, Let's say, can, may I? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, you mentioned a lot large deviation. Uh-huh. And it's a major tool, mm -hmm. but the context and the connection to, you also mentioned axiom A at factor, mm -hmm. but early on in your talk, I was very tempted to, to ask, are all these tools a different dress for talking about attractor and properties of the dynamical systems, which are sometimes difficult otherwise to identify. That, that that's right. So 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 okay. So if you hear okay, so you heard me talking about axiom A, you heard me talking about shifts of finite type. And the reasons why I talked about those is I know those dynamical systems in a way are well behaved. They're mixing, they have kind of uh, continuity properties. You know, people, dynamicists understand them in the statistical sense. Now, proving something in general about a dynamical system is extremely hard. It's extremely, extremely hard for just any general dynamical system. You know, you know identifying things, saying things are, are, are really extremely challenging, right? And so when I start telling you that they're, you know, start talking about this large deviation property or these Gibbs measures, right? Um, I think, yeah, in a sense, you're, you're right. You know, it's the same phenomenon in all of those. These have some type of mixing at some exponential scale, <clears throat> but you can say something. Are we trying to elucidate the magic of the Bayesian which sometimes naively looks very unintuitive by, by developing all these tools and framework, and especially the finite time, because you know the Markov chain has burning time mm -hmm. and some inherent difficulty when you go to computations. Mm -hmm. So when you push it to finite time, you sort of cap it and you you try to help me understand Bayesian. <laughs> so so there's one thing, you know, for for me to tell you that you know there's a burn in and things like that and this is what it should be using the results that I've told you so far, I can't because I have not assumed what the mixing rate is. If I knew the mixing rate, I could answer your question, right? About what kind of burn-in time you need. But the problem is in general, uh, for, for some of these systems, we, we, we don't know what the, the mixing rate is, right? Uh, there are systems where you can say something, but in the general setting, it's very hard to say. So getting rates is actually uh, quite challenging. So yeah. Okay, now going to the future part of your talk about the dimension. Mm -hmm. Again, in the dynamical system approach, we talk about Hausdorff attractor and dimension and so mm -hmm. on. And again, it's like you talk makes things more explicit on mysterious part of that study. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, so, okay, let's say I have my state U, right? And then I have this observation process Y, okay? 
Now, let's say instead of giving you, I gave you a lower dimensional projection of it. Let's call it V, okay? And the question is, can I use this lower dimensional projection, right, to model my system? Okay, so for now, let's just get rid of the Ys just to make our lives a little bit easier, okay? So this is an idea of topological conjugacy, which is a useful idea. So two functions, S and T, are topologically conjugate if there exists a homeomorphism pi, right? such that you have this conjugacy property. Now, why might I care about this, right? The reason why this is nice is if I go across and down, it's the same as just going across. So my errors are not gonna accrue, okay? Um, this idea of topological conjugacy, again, showed up when people studied shifts of finite type. Uh, shifts of finite type, this discrete alphabet were used to study continuous time dynamical systems. And what you could sometimes show is if you have this type of topological conjugacy, this continuous object up here will have the same type of ergodic properties as this discretized alphabet downstairs, right? So that, that was one of the uses, okay. Now, what's a factor map? If I have two systems, T and S, and there's a map from U to V, if this map pi is measurable, if for each V, you look at the image of pi and V, right? You have this measure preserving, you have this measure property, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for mu almost all U, you have this property in terms of the maps, then V is a factor of V. Okay, uh, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, so that's what's going on here, okay? Um, so this is my factor map. Now, what was I going to say? So again, shifts of finite type were thought of factors as some type of continuous system. Okay. So the, the idea of a factor, right, suggests that instead of asking for conjugacy, which might be a lot, right, can I minimize the Kale divergence, right, between u, mu, and n, and v, and vn, right? Or can I measure just one step ahead error? Right? So this is this idea. So what we've started playing around with, right, is can we implement something like this, okay? Now, I wanted to give you one statistical idea and then come back to talking about this. Okay. There's something called a partial factor model. So if I'm trying to predict Y given X, okay, and this beta is gonna be kind of project, like a low dimensional projection, just a linear projection, okay? So what I can do is I can place a factor model on X. So basically I can write X as a set of bases, okay? Multiplied by this, this set of coefficients, right? And the point is that this F is going to be a lower dimensional space, okay? Now the statistical problem is basically you wanna learn A, that's my projection pi star and B, which is my map. And what you can do is basically you can think of X and Y as a joint distribution, okay? But make life simple, it's normal. And then the sigma is gonna be A transpose plus this gamma, right? And so this is what you're getting, this is. And so now basically, now that you have this, you can, instead of modeling X and Y, you can also try to model these Fs, right? So you can model this triplet and this is what your sigma is gonna look like. And there's very standard Bayesian models to now infer A and B. And this is called a partial factor model. And what we've been basically doing is thinking about uh, infinite dimensional version of this or in our reproducing Colonel Hilbert space to try to learn these maps, okay? Uh, so the last thing I was gonna do, convergence rates, there's certain things that we're trying to do. This computational issue is what I wanna talk about for a little bit. Um, and then I will stop. So let's, let me stop share because I have to show you something else. Okay. Uh, shoot.
great. Okay, and I apologize that I, I didn't get a chance to put this into slides, but I wanted to talk a little bit about this, okay? So this, what I'm showing you are, um, is, is work that a graduate student at UNC Chapel Hill is doing. His name is Kevin O'Connor. And this is joint work with Kevin O'Connor and my colleague, uh, Andrew Nobel at Chapel Hill and Kevin McGough, who is at UNC uh, Charlotte, okay? okay? You see me saying something about Gibbs posterior, okay? So again, think about this as your likelihood. This is our Gibbs posterior inference. And if you remember earlier on in the talk, I said that you can think of this Gibbs posterior as this variational problem over joinings, okay? So now I'm gonna actually ask a question is, can I actually implement it, right? Can I come up with an algorithm that's gonna give me posterior samples of this Gibbs posterior, right, over joinings, okay? Now let's talk about it a little bit more. Okay. Okay. So we have a posterior P0N. Okay. And, you know, there's a partition function here. And this is how we think about the partition function. Right. And so then we, again, we have a posterior. Now, as we said before, you can try to solve this family. You can solve basically this variational problem over joinings, that's just as we said before. So here's your KL part, this is your loss part. Okay, so far so good. Now, here is a negative loss. Okay, so again, just stated as this partition function. Now, one of the things that if you look at this, you have this question of, how do I solve this loss, right? Um, because this looks like a, I'm sorry, this looks like a, a, well, this is an integral. You don't have access to this integral, right? So one question is how you solve this, right? So in practice, you basically replace this integral with a sum on your data, right? And you can try to minimize this or sample for this, okay? So I'm gonna give you a very concrete example, right? Which we started with, which is looking at a finite state Markov chain. So you just wanted to understand in the case where our Gibbs posterior was coming from a finite state Markov chain, right? Can we draw posterior? Can we get posterior drops? Okay. So this is our loss. This is my posterior. Okay. Now, what you can do is you can run some type of Metropolis Hastings algorithm from this to sample from the Gibbs posterior. Okay. You can also basically um, do some type of rejection sampling as well, okay? So these are two ideas and, um, and under certain conditions, we can tell you how this mixes, right? What's a mixing time is and how well it performs. Now, the other thing, the thing that we're doing right now that we're working on um, is approximate Markov chain. So there are cases, right? Where evaluating the likelihood is very expensive, okay? But simulating might be cheap. So let's say I have a potential function, I'm looking at the shifts of uh, finite type setting, right? And let's say I just, you know, iterate my map and, 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 and you know, and, and get draws, right? Um, can I use that? Can I use that simulation-based approach to get samples? And can I say something about uh, a Markov chain, okay? So, so this idea is if you have a Markov chain, right? And you know that it's got, it's mixing and it has a stationary distribution. Then I say, okay, let me use, let's say I, I have, uh, instead of that transition kernel, okay? I have another transition kernel that I can compute a lot faster, right? Uh, but it has a different stationary measure, right? Can I use that? to get more samples and do a little bit better in terms of the variance. So that's, that's what we've been working on here. And we can basically show you um, that for this approximate kernel, in total variation, you're getting reasonable behavior, okay? Now, now what we're trying to do, and let me just give you a result and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop. 
So yeah, so these are, can we show some complex convergence? These are our complexity measures for these different types of algorithms. But let, let me just kind of tell you what, what our ultimate goal is. Our ultimate goal is to look at something like, for example, an Ising model, right? Uh, and show that we can use this Gibbs posterior to basically very quickly sample from this Ising model, okay? Um, now, 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 now the, 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 a lot of the motivation for this is um, that let's say I'm interested in something like an Ising model or I'm interested in dynamics, right? And they're very, 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 very long lags, right? So this is an extremely high order Markov chain. So if it's an extremely high order Markov chain, actually writing down that entire Markov process uh, is gonna be really hard. Uh, evaluating it is going to be quite, um, quite, quite complex. But in a way, if you know, um, if you know that it's a shift of finite type, for example, you can simulate it very easily, right? Because you just, you know, use whatever map you want and just generate this process and then look at the loss, okay? So now what we're trying to do is say, okay, if you can do this fast, simu uh, fast uh, simulation, can I use a Gibbs posterior, right? And can I use this uh, to prove something about convergence? And the kind of the key idea there is we know uh, for things like shifts of finite type, given a particular potential function, for some of them, we know mixing times, right? And so the idea is, can we use those mixing time results to do the simulation-based approach and actually try to uh, draw these samples from the Gibbs posterior? So that's that's kind of what we're, we're, we're looking at. And ultimately, we're gonna try to look at things beyond Markov chains, also things like particle filtering, so on and so forth. But that is what we are working on in terms of this, uh, this more applied problem. And I will stop. All right, thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Um, I have one question, but I'm gonna wait for Robert to, to ask his question first. Yeah, Robert, if you can unmute him. Okay, uh, I'm happy if you'd like to go ahead with your question first. Oh, okay, great, great. So um, I'm, I'm gonna take you up on that offer. <laughs> so uh, just a quick question in the first part of your talk, um, uh -huh. you talked about alpha mixing, um, but then it seemed like you could get away with just topological mixing. You didn't, you didn't seem to need this mixing property to hold uniformly over your... Yes, you are, you are exactly right. I just introduced it like, cause I think it's a little bit clearer of a concept than topological mixing, right? But yeah, I didn't need that alpha mixing. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I think it, I, 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 I use that actually to help statisticians cause I think statisticians are more comfortable with that than, uh, than straight topological mixing. Uh, yes, so if I may ask um, a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, first, first uh, thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, I didn't catch everything. It went very fast. But um, <clears throat> anyway, um, have you thought about uh, ways of representing Gibbsian processes, uh, I'd say, in quotes, optimally, or at least uh, semi-optimally? You know, it's, it's like uh, if you want to represent an end-step Markov process, well, it'd be a good idea to get hold of most of the one step dependence first, and then regard the two step dependence as a slight correction, et cetera. Mm -hmm. The Gibbsian mm -hmm. process is just a, an infinite version of that. So, have you thought about that? We have. It, how do I? Okay. Not directly the way that you are stating it, but. Mm. But in a way, when I when I when when we're, when we're talking about this kind of this computation and the sampling from joinings, that's kind of inherently in that idea. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, uh, never stated explicitly, but you're exactly right, right? Mm -hmm. When I, when I, when I told you the story about if I know something or if I have a good potential function, right, then I can constrain the mixing time, right? Another way of telling that story is that potential function is giving me my decays, 
right? In terms of first, you know, first order, second order, da 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 da. Yeah. It has some nice kind of properties. So, so uh, thinking about making things more explicit is actually, uh, I think, very very interesting. Mm -hmm. There's another idea implicit in what you said, which I think is also uh, a very, uh, I think it's an interesting idea, which is. When, 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 when statisticians think about um, MCMC, they usually do not think about, when they think about proposal distributions, they do not think about the differential structure of the space, of the map, right? They, mm -hmm. they, they typically don't think about that. So another thing that could be interesting is, and this you can do this in the context of product particle filtering as well, is you can put more particles in the expansive directions and far fewer right uh -huh. in the relative directions, right? Yeah, good idea. And, yeah, and I think there's there's a paper by uh, Alex Shoren and 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 a few other people where they kind of thought about uh, uh, where they did something like that for for UQ, but it's not typically done in the Bayesian setting. And I think again that this touches a little bit upon the representation and what you were talking about. Yeah. Okay, and my other question is, um, <clears throat> so you're asking about ways of computing the infimum over joinings. So uh, does, um, is there some form of Cantorovich duality that might help? Yeah, so, so there, there, there is some form of Cantorovich, uh, I, I didn't like to speak as well. There is some form of Cantorovich duality, hmm. which might help. And there's, uh, there's, uh, there's work by uh, Kevin O'Connor Kevin McGough and Andrew Nobel, where they've tried to work some of that out. Okay. Um, and, and, and actually, if you want, the, the, the implementations of it become, you know, the ones that are more feasible uh, are related, become related to something uh, which is, which, you know, people call entropic regularization, uh -huh. right? So, so yeah, yeah, yeah. But yes, there, there is. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. What, what we don't know actually, and this is related to your, your question, which is um, how do you think about the you know, SD version of optimizing over joinings, number one, right? Mm -hmm. Number two, is there some type of uh, JKO scheme, right? That would lay, lead for you know, fast what is, solution. What is JKO? Oh, sorry, this is uh, uh, Jordan, uh, Jordan Keller and... Uh, okay. And uh, auto, right? So this is a kind of classic Ricci curvature kind of way of, of thinking about couplings and 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 Wasserstein, right? So is there an adaptation for that for uh, for the dynamics or the joining case? Yeah. Hmm. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? A super naive if the decay. <clears throat> the decay of correlation happens, mm -hmm. do we get uh, statistical independence? Uh, of... <laughs> let's see. Let me, let me, okay. I want to say yes, but I also want to be a little bit careful, okay? Which is if you have decay in correlations and if you go then if you go far enough out, basically you have independence, right? Because it's, you know, you, you've forgotten everything, right? Uh, and, and, and so what are you really doing? You're just like saying, well, instead of N, you have some smaller N, which is your effective sample size. And my theory is all going through, right? So uh, what you just said is actually true, okay? Now, and that's actually, you know, used as a, almost as a proof technique. Right there's this there's this idea people use in MCMC theory called big blocks little blocks, right? And again, these this which is really uh, a proof instantiation of what you're saying is if you look long enough, right, things have become decorrelated, right? Um, yeah, I don't know if that was helpful. Well, it does, but uh, if I if allow if you allow me to get very wild. How is this connected to entanglement or decoherence? It's a bit of a different field. That question. It's a different field. Well. Yeah. So, so maybe maybe we can. <laughs> so 
I've never thought about it in terms of the quantum mechanics perspective. I, I will say I've thought about it, uh, uh, you know, because of what I've done very much more from a statistical mechanics perspective. And from the statistical mechanics perspective, you know, these potential functions, uh, you can have, you know, infinite um, effects, like something infinitely far away can affect you. But there's, you know, because it's a potential function, because you have this Gibbs property, you know, there is some nice, there's something nice going on and there's kind of a decay of this. And so it's not going to go completely wild, right? Uh, I, I have not thought about it from a quantum mechanics perspective. So I don't, yeah, I don't know if I can give it. Oh, I know I can't give an answer. Yeah, because the world is all about correlations. Yeah. If you can have arbitrarily strong correlations at infinite lengths, right? I mean, all bets are off and this whole Gibbs structure will, will fall apart. It's not gonna hold. Okay, great. So I, I yeah, I mean, maybe some people know this. Is there some version of the thermodynamic formalism for quantum systems? Does anyone know? Yeah, good question. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> that would be really interesting, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, some, uh, yeah I didn't, never thought about this connection, but it sounds interesting. <laughs> that would be cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. But it's know, similar, but clarity, intuitively, it seems to be possible, isn't it? Yeah. Entanglement think so. or disentanglement is really a hot topic in quantum computing and and so on. And it all has to do with correlations. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting question. I, I think it's a very interesting question about, um, is there a way of using the thermodynamic formalism to study quantum entanglement? I think, is, is, I think that's a really interesting question. Yeah, yeah. So like I have a quick question actually about the okay, if you have like a, a parameter and in, in the your dummy system and then this slightly uh, changing uh, changing slowly like you, you talked at the beginning about the logistic map mm -hmm. and then you are assume that you are changing your uh, your coefficient slowly mm -hmm. uh, so yeah and so this will have yeah many dynamic regimes I mean how would you approach this I mean if you put like a yeah a yeah. Slide, yeah. So for example, when the, in the case of the dynamic linear model, right, um, this is something that actually, uh, of some variations of this is something that Ling Xuan has been looking at. And I think with Jonathan actually, with Jonathan Mattingly, uh, and the, you know, their one way of thinking about it is that there are different timescales, right? The state update is at one timescale, the observation is another timescale, then you can try to use, show something. And I think what, what they're using are more um, Grisinoff type tools to try to show something, right? Uh, so, so that is one answer. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Shayan, and as well as Azadi and Michele for this uh, interesting afternoon. So uh, thanks again. Yeah, thank you. Very much. It was a, I, yeah, I had a lot of fun listening to the talks today. Not so much mine, but I really enjoyed the other ones. Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed the three of them. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Thanks thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.